And in there was a police report from 1969 of a, a disturbance and two young children found in an upstairs bedroom. I would wake up with a horror. It's in the book where I, would, I was being pinched with his hand over my mouth. Then he would cuddle me as to make things better. But he stunk, you know. And I looked at these magazines, but they weren't, they weren't men and women, they were men and men. Uh, he would always make me go to his flat to get my wages and he'd give me a drink or something. And um, do you like wrestling and blah, 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 you know. Next minute I know he's got me in a wrestling hold and on the bed and he's wrestling me and, and uh, he sat up on the bed and he, he, he had his top off. He, I remember he was always hairy and horrible. And, uh, and he said, now take your shorts off and I wouldn't do it. I said, nah. He, he, he wanted to play a game and uh, I just wanted my money. You know, I'll get you your money when you just play this game with me. And I was just like, oh. you know, you do. You're just like, oh. I didn't have a clue what was coming. I was like, okay. So I've got this guy standing in front of me and he's like, take your top off. And I didn't want to, next minute I know, my top's off. So I'm standing there feeling, coming up, how am I going to get through it? And I'm not going to sit and lie to you. I, I sat in the shower at two in the morning, cried my eyes out and thought, I can't do this. Mm. Don't be afraid. If you have been abused, don't let these people get away with it. There are the police now, I've got special teams and they do believe you. Mm. Don't sit there and suffer because if you if you do suffer, it will come back in your later years. It did, and it nearly destroyed me. Truth. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm lucky. Yeah. All right. So many of you watched the harrowing video we did called "Pure Evil Dad," and how brave she was as a survivor, and what happened to her pure evil dad. And if you saw the end of that video, it was a very sad outcome whereby he got sentenced to something like 10 years with back time. And all he had to do was like three or four more years and then he got out and he even wrote a letter to the judge mocking the whole process. And the judge said, you're the most evil man ever to step foot in my courtroom, but all I can give you is 10 years or whatever it was. And he got out and went back to his wife and it was just a disgusting situation. Now on this channel, as many of you know, we've been campaigning for an end to the war on drugs and mass incarceration and putting all these people in prison who've got mental health issues and addiction issues and taking all that money and going after these people who are attracted to kids. Now this story is going to have a far better outcome. It's going to be a harrowing story. So I'm giving you a warning right now. If Stories of this nature are not to your liking. You need to go and watch something else because we're going to go to some very dark places. But the positive thing is, and this, this just makes me so happy to see, and I hope this is a turning point in the UK justice system. This guy got 230 years. And if you think I'm pulling that from the clear blue, Google Nigel Clayton. And I'm here with Paul Stevens and Amy. Um, this is Paul's first book, You Can't Hurt Me. And it made such an impact legally that the cops had it removed when it was on its first edition. Paul's got his second book out now, Beyond the Hurt, and he's working on the third book. And this whole case, because many of us know, if you've watched our Savile documentary, many of you know the, the offending goes over decades. This case, it goes over 40 plus years where well, this person was, was pretending to offer jobs to kids and he had all kinds of methods that we're going to get into that how, how he, you know, he facilitated this absolute horror show for over 40 years. And with some of our other survivors as well, things have been reported to the police repeatedly and they've never done anything about it. We had the, we had another woman on whose who's, who's dad did things to her and um, it took her 30 plus years of reporting it to the police to get anything done. But anyway, so this ties in wonderfully with the mission on this channel to get these bastards put away for long terms. Um, but we just got a salute, Paul, and Amy's got a role in it as well. 
for this outcome, man. This is absolutely fantastic news to us. And all your links, all Paul's links will be in the description box if you want to check his book out. Go over to his social, support him. Whatever he's got, we're going to put all that down there. All right, before we get into this nightmare, then, Paul, huge thank you for coming on, both you guys. Nice to meet you. And just, just to set, like, the foundation of your story then, what was it like for you growing up and whereabouts in the country did you grow up? Yeah, I, I grew up in South London um, from about... Uh, from about 18 months old, I was in and out of children's homes and stuff. So I, um, yeah, life is pretty tough growing up as a kid, but- um, What did your parents do? I never knew my father. He, he, he was gone before I was born. Um, my mother wasn't a very nice person. Um, she, you know, she had her own reasons for the things that she did. But so, I, you know, my sister and I were both um, awarded court for a certain um, organization, and social workers that looked after us. Um, what, what age were you award of court? Roughly 18 months old was the first time. 18 months. Yeah, 1969, the police were first called to my, to my, my mother's address. Um, I know that because I've, I got my records from, from um, um, London Borough Sutton Social Services and in there was a police report from 1969 of a, a disturbance and two young children found in an upstairs bedroom. Um, and, uh, and that's when um, it soon became apparent that you know we were, uh, you know, in danger, as you as you as you say. Are you um, able to elaborate on what danger you were in? Um, my mother had various, um, many boyfriends. Um, I'm, you know, as I say, she got her own reasons for things she done. But um, so we mainly me, not my sister. My sister was a dog. My mum adored my sister. Unfortunately, I was the other. I was the other end of the scale and I wasn't. So, um, so I, you know, I would take a lot of the abuse that was sort of thrown around, you know. This um, is as a baby? From, as I say, from, a, from, from around 18 months, you know, in and out, you know, we was taken back in, you know, into care then, you know, you know back to my mum's regularly. Um, uh, but the social workers, my social worker, who was there to protect me? It made sense after I what I found out after the second book, after the first book had been published. I then started. I got my social services reports because I wanted to know more, and then I consequently found out that um, a social worker by the name of Mr. had um, had been having a sexual relationship with my mother, who was only eighteen, nineteen at the time. Um, so it all made sense then why I was, you know, going backwards and forwards, you know, um, to her. And then he wasn't the only person. There was numerous other men that were, that were also abusing us. Um, me, not my sister, me. And, uh, you know, and I would put myself between my sister and them because I was always the protective over my sister. Um, so um, Mr. Wakefield, who was there to protect us, wasn't, he was, you know, he was, he had his own agendas, so you know it, it was what it was. What's, what's your earliest memories? Um, my earliest memories, I think my earliest memory was I wrote in in the book that, uh, my earliest memories of, of growing up in that squalid flat um, were I mean I used to wake up with a terrible horror of being pinched. My way, my mum would always go out and lock us, me and my sister, into, we'd be locked in the bedroom. So, you know, being home alone when you, in 1969 to 1970, 172 was just a normal, no one really talked about it in them days. So I would, I would, um, 180 foot above the ground, I would climb out of a window into the kitchen, open, unlock the bedroom door so my sister could use the toilet. Because if, 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 if I wet myself, my mum would beat me, so. So I would then climb back through the window, 180 feet off the ground, true. And um, yeah, and lock, lock us back in because I was frightened because the time I did wet, which was a regular occurrence, unfortunately, growing up in that, as a child, you do wet the bed, I did, you know, and it, you know, and anything that, any anger my mum always had, it was always me that copped it, do you know what I mean? So that was probably the earliest memory. And then also at that time, my mum had numerous partners. So I, I, I remember, 
probably went on, I don't know how long it went on for, but maybe three or four months. I would wake up with a horror. It's in the book where I, would, I was being pinched with his hand over my mouth. The, uh, but I couldn't scream because he had his hand over my mouth. Do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah. Then he would cuddle me as to make things better. But he stunk of BO and body odor and stuff. Well, I have a real problem with, with BO now. I can't have anybody. It's just, it just triggers things a bit. Anyway, he would then lie me down take his hand off my mouth as the, and I would try, you know, pretend to be asleep. Then he would pinch me again. And he would do this two or three times in the book. I write about how I wanted my sister to wake up, but she never woke up. I wanted to, you know what I mean? You want someone there to help you, but they, they weren't there. So this went on for a while and then just like that, it stopped. So this man was obviously gone from her life. Do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, so it only became a, it only became apparent when again the social worker saw bruises and stuff, and but never done anything about it. So that was my upbringing, you know. What about entering school? Um, school, school was a nightmare. Yeah, to be honest with you, you know, again, it's all in there. What I write about going to school for, I remember going to school for the first time and all the kids having their nice uniforms, their hair cut, you know what I mean? And I always describe myself as Huckleberry Finn because, you know, we was always, you know, and it happened to loads of kids back in that day. We all, people went to jumble sales. They didn't have the money they got now. They can't, they didn't get things on credit and things. So we, you know, my clothes were hand-me-downs. So, do you know what I mean? And uh, so, yeah, that, so school was always, I was branded as you always get a kid that's untidy and, you know, un unclean and do you know what I mean? So, did, did yeah, so bullying was a part of, of my growing up. So school for me wasn't school. It was just a survival, to be honest with you. Were you able to make friends in school at all? To be honest with you, one or two, but not really because you was always, if, if, if you know what it's like, a school with bullies and things, if, it, you know, you, they want to be friends with you, but they can't be because they can't see to be. So no, school was a problem. So all the bullying and the chaos at school, and did that prevent you from studying, concentrating on your studies? Yeah, I, I, I wrote this book on, on just A4. I wrote just with a pen, and um, my uh, the, the the guy that published the book, uh, Martin Goldman, lovely man. Uh, he was he would go through it, and a good friend of mine, Kevin, he would go through it for me, and then we'd sort out the spelling mistakes and stuff. So yeah, you know, so no, school wasn't great for me. I'm not saying I'm, I'm not a stupid man. I've done very, you know, I'm not bigging myself up or making myself out to be better than anybody else, but I've, I'm, I'm successful in business. I've, I've worked really hard over the years, you know, in Australia, I've, you know, I'm, I don't have to worry about things over there. Do you know what I mean? I'm, 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 I'm set up for life. I'm okay because I'm a builder. I've went, you know, I went to college. I learned how to. Uh, the building industry has always been something that I'm good at. So work ethic has always been my saviour. You know, do you know what I mean? So. Did you have any early interests, like sports or anything? Um, yeah, somewhat. I was, uh, yeah, I was um, a very good athlete. Very, very good athlete. What part of athletics? I ran eight and fifteen hundred meters as my specialist. I won Surrey schools. Uh, I ran national level. Um, there's a couple of really good chapters in there about my running. I was actually, um, I was actually fostered by my coach who, um, it's actually quite a funny chapter how I get into running. I was actually entered into a, a school race. I went to the, probably the roughest school on the manor, um, at the time. And, uh, we was invited to run in a very, very big cross country race, uh, which was run by a, a school called Collingwood, which was a private school. So you had all the top schools in the South of England would turn up for these races. So we was invited one day and it was the first four that it made the, you know, we used to run half a mile to our football pitch as we didn't have any grounds or anything. And then we run back again. So the first four that got to football pitch were in the team. That was how it was picked. So there was like probably 400 kids in my race that particular day. We turned up in football boots and football kit and you've got all these posh calls, which is spikes and track suits. And, um, and my football coach said to me, you might be the quickest at school, but you won't win this race. And then I was, looked at all these, these pasty face <laughs> posh kids thinking, nah, don't tell me I can't win because I know I can. Because what I used to do when I was in care, I would keep the bus money and I'd run to school. Use the bus money, pay penny up the wall, make more money. You got, you got me. You done what you done, didn't you? So, um, and then I'd run back again. So I could run like the wind, and it was just something I was gifted with. I don't know where it came from, but I could run. So anyway, this race was so. I went. This race started. I went straight to the front, and I beat some of the top boys in the south of England. 
I ran through the finish line, straight back to the change room, because our teacher said to us, as soon as the race is finished, you can go home. It was, it was like two o'clock in the afternoon. I'd never even stopped. I ran straight through the finish line, went to the changing rooms, got my gear and disappeared, not knowing what I'd done. The next day in school, I had to, you know, I was presented with this big trophy and, you know, and then I saw, I met my coach, as I say, a lot of it's all in the book that I've written and my coach happened to turn out to be a real mentor to me, a lovely man called Terry Knight, a lovely, lovely man. Um, I then started running for his club, um, which was a private club. So of course, again, I wasn't accepted because of my appearance and the way I was, you know, I wasn't accepted by the kids accepted me and they were lovely. You know, even though they were posh kids, private schools, they were private school boys and they accepted us and they were lovely, lovely people. But the, the, the parents, again, you was victimized. They didn't want to know you. And because I was such a good athlete, they couldn't beat me. So, you know, so that was basically how I started into athletics. But my coach always, always made a point and he was a lovely man. And he's, you know, he was like, you just crack on, don't worry about it. And uh, he said, one thing that these kids have got, they might have ever, but they haven't got that. They haven't got your heart. They haven't grown up your way. And you will, and he used to laugh at me because I would be, I trained so hard. I would make myself sick. I trained so hard because I wanted to win. And because he was so nice to me, I wanted to please him. You understand? Like my mum and all the other people around me that were horrible to me by telling me I couldn't be anything and I would never be anything and you'd never be no good. You're like your father. My mum used to say to me, you're fucking useless, like, excuse my French, but you're like your father. You'll never be, you'll never materialise into anything, you're useless. So what they've done is that drove, because I didn't want to be, I wanted to be somebody. I don't know where it came from. So, so my coach knew this. So I never lost a school race. I never won. I never lost district sports. I never, I ran Surrey champs, always won my age group. Won national, I was the only person there was an athlete called, um, who was, uh, actually came from Nigeria. And back in them days, if you came to the UK, um, you, you, your birth certificate, you didn't have a birth certificate, you didn't have anything. So we all knew he was older than us. So I would beat everybody by a mile. He would beat me the same. <laughs> and I could not understand how he could beat me the way he did. But my coach said, one day you will beat him. Just keep going, keep, tri you know, do you know what I mean? But because I was in care and backwards and forwards and my life was up and down, I could never get to training a lot of the time. So he fostered me when I was 13. He took me out of care and he gave me a home. I was training. I went to the south of France. We went training with a young England squad. So I was, you know, I had a, an amazing future ahead of me. I even had a scholarship arranged for America when I was 17 to go to America, to Iowa State. My coach had arranged it. All I had to do was run the qualifying, time, qualifying times was already run. Um, but unfortunately, when I was 15, he, he, got, um, he got liver cancer and he died. Oh, dear. So within four months, he, he was gone. So, yeah, so my dream went with him. Unfortunately, when he died, I went back into care and, and that, was the end of, that was the end of my running career because I, I'd lost interest after that. I didn't want to do it. You know. Because of the chaos in your life then, was running helping you psychologically and giving you a positive focus? To this day, it still does. Amy, I tell you, I train every day. And if I, and if I don't train, like, if I don't train, if I have a day or two off, for some reason, I can't get there. I have to have to train. It's just a part of my life, and and I still train at a high level. I, you know, I box at a high level. I've boxed at a good level. I was a boxing coach for a lot of years. I trained kids. You know, I put a lot back into the in, into the system with the, a lot of these troubled young boys, which was amazing for me. For ten years, I've done that, and um, and to turn their lives around. And I still see them to this day. They're a lot older now, and they're mm -hmm. you know lovely people, and they've done really well. They've, a lot of them gone to university, and you know. So to give what a coach gave to me, I've given to oh, them. Oh, that's brilliant. So, yeah. Um, so do you waive your anonymity then for this story? Yeah, a million percent, yeah. When did Nigel Clayton come into your life? Um, I was 10. Um, no, te no, let's go back. I was about eight or nine, and I used to go to school in the area. Um, and my school was on, this, on an estate where we lived, and about... 100 meters from the school was a was a, a small block of flats um and i used to go to school with a, a a dear friend of mine who we're still friends with aren't we allison allison sell she's a lovely girl um and i used, we was only kids we was babies i'd knock for her in the morning and i'd her mum used to be off to work so I'd, we'd have a cup of tea and a bit of toast and um and then we'd go to school together well she lived in a flat below 
Nigel, who was the caretaker of the grounds. So that's how I got to know him. And he offered, because I used to help the milkman. I used to do a paper round. I'd be up at 5.30 every morning. I'd, I'd help the milkman. When I got to school, I'd do the milk round at school. Then the kind ladies and the dinner, the, the dinner ladies would give me tea and, you know, and then I'd go and look for Alison. That's how I met him. And he offered me a job around the flats, just tidying up, a bit of weeding in the gardens, helping him with, you know, mowing the lawns and stuff. And that's how I got to know him. How was he known at that point in time? Was he just known as like someone who was helping people out? Yeah, he, he was a really, he came across as really kind. And because I had known the milkman for years, I used to help the milkman every day. And I used to do a paper round, so I knew the guy from the shop every day. And I helped Harry in the oil yard. I used to do a paraffin round at weekends. And, and Harry was a, so I, I trusted these people. I didn't trust many people in my life, but I trusted these few people that I knew. So he seemed a really nice guy. He seemed on the same level as them. So I had no reason to not trust him. I, and he was, he was giving me little odd jobs and stuff. Um, and yeah, so I'd say between nine and 10, I started helping him out and, um, and sort of got to know him that way. And he was really, always really friendly and, you know, but I just thought he was a nice guy. I didn't, you know, I was, I was a baby. I didn't know anything about anything like, you know, what, you know, what was or what people were in them days. I didn't have a clue because, you know, my mum was too wrapped up in her own little sordid world to be worried about what we were doing. I mean, I'd be out in the morning at 5.30. She wouldn't even know, never asked a question. And I'd be out all day and I'd get back in. She wouldn't, wasn't interested. Were there any weird situations or warning signs as this job for him progressed? He, about, I suppose when I was about 10 and a half, I suppose he took us, he had a house in um, about three miles from where he lived. And uh, he said that he had to clear the cellar. And, um, and he asked if I would, um, did I want to go over and help him clear the cellar out in his house? Of course, you know, it was more money. I mean, it was, you're, you're talking pennies as a kid but 40 or 50p was a lot of money to me because i had nothing honestly so to me to go over there on it so it was in always of an evening it was i remember it was summer because it, it was um it was after because i used to train in the local park with you know with my club and stuff so um so i'd go training and i'd go to his and i would help him with the gardening and stuff but this time he took us to this house and we were clearing the boxes in this and he um he gave me some magazines and um and of course my mum's husband at the time, you know, you know, you know, it's like when you're a kiddie, 10 and a half, 10, you know, you see, you know, you're out with your group of friends, you see dirty magazines in them days, you're like, oh, you're, you're intrigued. Of course, you're going to look, oh, have a look, you know, you know, you, you know, you know how it is. But he gave me these magazines and he said, have a look at them, tell me what you think. And I sort of, I, I was embarrassed. I didn't know what to say. It's different when an adult gives you something. And um, I just sort of, and he put me in a carrier bag and he, because he could see I was embarrassed. Anyway, when, when we left and, he said, don't forget your, your magazine. So I walked off, you know, and I looked at these magazines, but they weren't, they weren't men and women, they were men and men. So in them days, you know, pornography, it was all foreign. So they were obviously, they weren't English. You know, I'd never seen anything like it. And I was actually, to be honest with you, I was horrified and I threw them away, weren't interested. The next week I went back round and we went back to the same, the same cellar and we were clearing boxes and stuff. And he asked me what I thought of the magazines and he could tell my embarrassment. And I said, oh, I didn't really think much of them sort of thing. And then he sort of asking me questions, you know, did I have a girlfriend? And I was like, well, you know, he could tell my embarrassment, but he was softening me up. Do you know what I mean? Um, and that sort of went a bit quiet then for a while. And I just carried on and I put it to the back of my mind. I just carried on as normal for another, perhaps another month or two. Um, and then I went, I went round on a normal, or he paid me every Thursday, maybe 30 or 50p, I, I can't remember, but it was minimal. But uh, he'd always make me go to his flat to get my wages and he'd give me a drink or something. And um, we, we went, he, he asked me about wrestling, because in them days you'd watch wrestling on TV, Big Daddy, Giant A Stacks, you remember. And um, do you like wrestling and blah, 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 you know. Next minute I know he's got me in a wrestling hold and on the bed and he's wrestling me and and uh, I managed to sort of get away of it and I thought it was a bit strange do you know what I mean and uh, and I sort of stood at the end of the bed and he, he and I don't know why I done it but he I, I always used to go 
with my training gear because I didn't have I didn't have a tracksuit. I didn't have any money, but my I had shorts and a vest and my running shoes. And so when it's warm like it is now, I I would just go training and I would go straight round to Nigel's to get my money. And um, he uh, he asked me to take my top off, and uh, and I don't know to this day I don't know why I did it, but I did it. I took my top off, and I was for my age. I was quite a big boy for my age, and because I was a, an athlete. Um, I was very muscular, so he then he's, he's you know he sat up on the bed and he he, he had his top off. And he, I remember he was always hairy and horrible, and uh, and he said, "Now take your shorts off," and I wouldn't do it. I said, "Nah, uh, you know, no." I said, "No, I don't want to take my shorts off," and I made some excuse and I just grabbed my top off the bed, and I said, "See ya," and I got to go, and I just and I left, um, and that that was the end of that. That was the first sort of time I knew it was strange, and and to this day. Yeah, that, that horrifies you and I had to say this in court because they was asking you know why you go back do you know what I mean but you do you're a kid you don't understand properly you know it's not there's no way to comprehend what his intention is and what's going on really yeah I knew it was I knew it weren't right but I didn't to be honest with you I, I never had I had nothing as a kid nothing and I mean nothing. Honestly, it was it was jumble sale clothes or I didn't have nothing. I had a pair of running shoes that my coach slipped into a bag for me and said, don't, don't, this is for you, don't you know what I mean? And, and things like that. And I had a running kit given to me. You know what I mean? My coach knew my predicament. He knew my situation. But because I was such a good athlete and he loved me the way he did, um, he would always you know, look out for me. Do you know what I mean? So, so I went back round the next week and nothing really happened. Um, I just was working with him as usual and uh, he seemed... So I just put it to the back of my mind. I didn't, I didn't, yeah, I didn't act on it. I should have, but I didn't, do you know what I mean? And I just carried on. I was still getting my bit, you know, my little bit of money and that was okay. Did you notice other kids working for him at the same time as you? No, nah, that was, that was the, that, that was, um, it was only me at that time. Um, he had, uh, and I don't know why I never told the police this because it completely slipped my mind. It's only afterwards when someone else came forward, he had St. Bernard dogs. And where we used to play, where the flats were, there was a, a big green over the back with a river that ran down the side of it. And the river turned in to the right and there was loads of trees and we had a rope swing. And all the kids on the manor used to make it the rope swing. We used to cook, we used to say, meet you over the swing. And this rope swing was, it was an amazing, it, was, it wasn't just a swing, it was pretty scary. You know, you was, you, was, you was sort of 20 foot above the river and you would go right across the river and back again. It was quite a, quite a thing and everybody used to meet at the swing. So. I remember now, um, after this all happened, how he used to bring his dogs over. He had some Bernard dogs, but this one particular dog, he'd always come over and he'd get the kids to ride on its back. And uh, we, being kids, you didn't give it a thought. Do you know what I mean? We didn't, he didn't, we'd never even thought about it. It was just like, oh, didn't even know who he was. He just seemed a nice guy. Do you know what I mean? And then obviously when I was at the swing, you know, I'd see him and he'd just say hi. And he didn't make a fuss of me then. It was, it wasn't, it wasn't, and I still didn't put two and two together. That's the truth. So, you know. All right. So what was the next situation that um, was inappropriate? Well, the, I went round on a Thursday, um, again, to get my money. And uh, he, he paid me and everything. And, and I had my vest on, I had my, sh my, my shorts on. And we were, his flat, he went up the stairs to his flat. And then you went in into his flat and then you went up some stairs, down some stairs. It was a weird setup and then into uh, a lounge and a kitchen. So we were just, just in the lounge and the kitchen, um, the lounge by the kitchen. And he, he, he wanted to play a game and uh, I just wanted my money. You know what I mean? And then he started talking in like a bit of a childish voice, like a child. Do you know what I mean? Like, and then you like this game, you like this game. And I just wanted my money. And he said, I'll, you know, I'll get you your money when you just play this game with me. And I was just like, oh, you know, you do. He's just like, oh. I didn't have a clue what was coming. I was like, okay, okay, you know. He said, you gotta do what I do. Okay, so, um, so he took his top off. I say, standing in front of me and he's got this, and he's so hairy. And, you know, it was actually quite, I look at it now and it repulses me. I can't do body hair. You'll see with me, I shave my head, I shave my chin. I, I, I can't have body hair around me. It, it turns me the other way totally, makes me angry. So I've got this guy standing in front of me and he's like, take the top off. And I didn't want to, next minute I know, my top's off. 
So I'm standing there feeling what is going on. Do you know what I mean? I didn't know what was going on. And I was just like, before I had a chance, and he's giggly all in a childish voice, which was really messing with my head. I didn't know what to do. So I've only got my shorts on and my socks. And um, next minute, he took his trousers off. You've got to do what I do in his childish voice. Come on, come on, come on. And I felt his belt hit my foot. So as he's dropped his trousers, his belt has hit my foot. And then I knew, I realized I was in serious trouble. And I said, I don't want to play this game anymore. He said, no, you must play this game. Come on, you like this game, you like this game. Um, and I didn't want to play this game. I said, no, I, I just, just, and to this day, I don't know. But I said, uh, I said, I didn't want to play this game. And I just said, please, and I just, it was the money. I just wanted the money like an idiot. I could have still left that flat had I just got my, I could have still got out then, but I didn't. I just, I just to this day, I don't know why, but I just said, just give me my money. I just give me my money and I'm, I've got to go. I've got, I'm going to be late home. But he knew I didn't have a home life and he knew my situation. He knew, he knew that it, you know, I was always out and about wandering. So he knew it didn't matter. So, um, no, he said, you're going to play this game. So gone from the childish voice into an adult voice, very authoritative, you're going to play this game. So then the fear hit me and I thought, he ain't leaving off. You know what I mean? And he was very powerful. All the other victims in the court case said how powerful he was. That when he, when he, when he claimed you, you couldn't get him off you. Do you know what I mean? So um, even, even the older boys that he'd, that he'd, um, that he'd abused... Um, that were in that were in their sort of mid teens, well, fifteen. They said the same. He was very powerful, um, and you once he claimed you, you couldn't get him off you. So I knew from wrestling with him on the bed that there was no way I was going to get out of there. And as I just thought, well, I just go along with his game. Just, just go along with his game, and it'll be over soon, and you'll get out of there. So anyway, take your shorts off. I just didn't want to take my shorts off. He said in his childish voice, come on, you'll go, you'll go, trying to get my, trying to get my, you know, uh, my confidence if you want, because it was only a game. But I only had my shorts on, do you know what I mean? So, anyway, my shorts, he's pulled my shorts down. So off comes my shorts, so I'm standing there. <clears throat> then he takes his underpants off. And I'm just standing there in my socks. And uh, in the court case, they said, the defense were obscene. She was a QC, she wasn't a nice person. I know she was only doing her job and she was paid a, an awful lot of money by him um, to get him off. And uh, she was messing with our head in, 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 you know, I'm standing there and she's saying to me, Mr. Stevens, in your book, you say that you, uh, you had your socks on, but in your police statement, you're saying you're standing there, you're standing there naked. So did you have your socks on or did you have your socks off? And I'm and I'm and I'm standing there thinking, what has that got to do with anything? So I had to tell her quite firmly, you know. I was eleven years old. Do you know what I mean? And I've got this guy standing in front of me. Excuse the pun, or excuse, I don't mean to be rude. With the biggest dick I've ever seen in my life, two inches from my face, and you want to you you're asking me, did I have my socks on or did I? I said I can't remember. 100%. If I wrote in the book that I had my socks off and I was naked, then I was naked. If I said in my police statement that I was standing there with just my socks on, I said, I can't, is, is it really relevant? Yes, but this is what she was, I found out afterwards that her case was so weak that she was trying to break me any way she could. And she said some obscene, evil things that you would never, you couldn't believe the things she was saying to get this man off. So anyway, I'm standing there and <clears throat> next minute I know he's, his socks are off and he says um he says he wants to i said the game's over now um but in his childish voice he's very excited now and he's standing in front of me and he's got hard on basically and so i'm standing at 11 and i'm thinking oh my god I've never seen anything like it. Of course, at school, you hear, you know, in a school playground, you have school, you know, I mean, listen, I was on a council state. I know I was 11 years old. You know, you, you talk, you know, kids talk is kids talk. You know, we talk about things, but I've never actually seen it. 
not 11 years old. So to see this guy standing in front of me with a, probably the biggest penis I've ever seen in my life, literally inches from my chest. Um, and I just said, look, the game's over now. No, it's not. No, it's not. Um, we've got one more game. And I said, you said the game, this is a game. He said, no, the game isn't over. We're, you know, in this childish voice again. So again, he's messing with my head, trying to get my confidence that it's just a game. It's just a game. It's just a game. You got to do what I do. And I said, uh, and I'm looking at this guy and I'm thinking, I woke, I wake, you know, who's a, a 11, you know, kiddie, you wake up with, with a hard on. Of course you do. That's, that's just a part of life growing up as a teenager. Of course you wake up with a stiffy. That's just life. But I couldn't just switch it on just because he wanted me to. Do you know what I mean? And of course, there's no way I could have because I was petrified. Do you know what I mean? So I started crying and I said, please, I just want to go home. Just let me go home. Uh, no, he said, you're going to finish this game so and then I'm really 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 worried thinking you know am I ever going to get out of this situation and how did I ever get into this situation do you know what I mean I remember the fear running through me and if I tell you the truth I'm not going to sit here and lie to you I can't lie everything I said in court turned out 100% true because he got convicted of every count against me so so I wet myself you know I was petrified um and he um he started masturbating in front of me and he said, I had to do the same. And I, there's no way I could do that. So he pushed me similar chairs to these really, but they weren't leather, but they were sit high back and quite stiff chairs. So he pushed me onto the chair and he's half leaning on me while he's masturbating. And he said, you've got to do what I do. You've got to do what I do. So he's getting more and more excited. Well, there's no way I could do that. You know what I mean? There was no way. And I kept saying to him, no, I was crying. Please, I don't want to do this. Let me go. And we go. Anyway, no, he wasn't having none of it. And he was getting more and more aroused. So he said, if you're not going to do it, I will. So he's then playing with me. And he's trying to get me aroused. And I can't. Then he sticks his finger in me. And he's getting more and more and more off it. And the pain was excruciating. Do you know what I mean? Like, it was, you know, and I'm crying because it was so... <sighs> yeah, because it was so painful. So he's, um, yeah, so, but he's getting more and more aroused. And, uh, and the more aroused I get, the harder he's sticking his fingers in me, you know what I mean? And, and trying to get me going, do you know what I mean? So at one minute, he's, he's and then he's pulling his, he's stopped masturbating and he's leaning on my chest while he's still putting his fingers inside me. And he's getting harder and harder and, you know, and he's, then he's wanking himself off again and, and I'm just, and I'm trying to breathe. And I'm in the corner of this sofa and I've, I've got his weight on me. Um, and I'm in agony and I'm crying, please stop, please stop. And he's not stopping. He, he, and I'm just thinking, he's going, I just don't know what to do. Do you know what I mean? I, I didn't know what to do. I would never experienced anything like it, obviously, not at that age. And um, next minute, he, he ejaculates everywhere, all over me all over my chest, all over my face. Um, and then he slumps on me. So I'm stuck with this lump, stinky, sweaty, hairy man on me. And then he slumps next to me and I'm just frozen. I don't know what to do. I'm bleeding and, and, um, and I'm in a bad way because he's completely violated me. Do you know what I mean? Um, and, uh, and I think it's over. Can I go now? No. No, he says, no, you're not going nowhere. And then I'm thinking, looking back on it, it I was looking back on it, I was never going to get out of that flat. I honestly believe to this day he would have killed me. And that's the truth. He would have killed me. He was going to kill me. I knew that. I knew that. Looking back at it, I know this. Only the fact, only thing my mum ever gave me, my mum had an evil temper. And once she lost her temper, she was, she was wild. Unfortunately for me, I have her temper, but over the years I can control it now. But as a child, I couldn't. It was my, it was my, my temper was my saviour. So if I was into, backed into a corner or bullied, kids knew they couldn't bully me because my temper was was nasty, and 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 I would fight to the end. So no one, no one, when I was sort of 11, 12, 13, no one picked on me anymore because they knew even if I lost, I would be the best second they would ever have. Do you know what I mean? So. Clayton then stood up in front of me and told me he had another game for me. And uh, 
I just was, I just didn't know what to say. If I looking back at it, I, I just didn't know what to do. I just, there's blood everywhere, you know, and I'm just crying. I don't know, just didn't, you know, didn't, you know, the worst of it all, most kids would have been, you know, what, and this is the truth. And I've never said this in the book. Most people have wanted their mum. All I wanted was to get out of there. I didn't even give her a fault. I just needed to get out of there. And the wor worst thing he could have done was slap me around the face. You're going to suck my dick. No, I'm not. And then two or three minutes later, two, two or three minutes later, he's got hard on again. And so I'm sitting here like this, and I've got this guy with his dick two inches from my mouth, and he's grabbing the back of my head, trying me, trying to force his into my into my mouth, and yeah, and um, so. Uh, I wasn't going to do it. I was like, no, I'm not doing that. I, I'm not going to do that. You will do that. So we're going back from the childish voice telling me I'm going to, his exact words were, you're going to suck my dick and I'm going to suck yours. So the, you can imagine, I already wet myself once and this guy's telling me that I've got to suck his dick and he's going to suck mine and I was just like panicked. There's no fucking way. The size of this thing, I thought you'd kill me. I've just had you inside me. Do you know what I mean? And that is just, you know, that was horrendous enough as it is. And now he wants to, do you know what I mean? So I'm like, and I just had to say, no, I said, no, I'm not doing it. I can't do it. I'm not doing that. I'm not, I said, no, I'm not doing it. And he's, he's trying everything he can to get me. And if I'm not going to do something, I will not do it. And I had to stand my ground no matter what. So slap, he slapped me around the face. I've stood up. You will. And I, and I started losing my temper. And I, and as a child, I used to get a tingling in my stomach and I knew I was going to lose my temper. It was, and I knew that once I lost my temper, it didn't matter who, who beat me. My mum would beat me black and blue, but if I lost my temper, I never felt anything. I never felt any pain. So I, all of a sudden, he's cracked me around the face. You will. And I felt this tingling in my stomach. And I looked at this person and then I'm beginning to get angry and he's cracked me again. You fucking well will. Well, uh, I don't know why or how I got the strength to do it, but I just lost just lost my temper for a split second. I was very powerful for an 11 year old. I was an athlete, you know, I was, and I would train like you can't imagine. So I was very, very powerful for, you know, and I just nutted him, run at him and headbutted him in the chest and screaming at him. You, I don't want to swear in front of the cameras, but you and C, you know, and thank God there was something behind him. I think it was a puffy or a coffee table. I can't remember exactly, but he's gone over backwards and fell and that was my opportunity that was my opportunity i grabbed my shorts and i was out and i ran i'll never forget it to this day and i ran up the stairs down the stairs up the stairs and then down the stairs and i was still naked i ran across i ran out the flats along along the path along the side of the flats and i ran to the walls to swing and the only thing i never looked over my shoulder because i was convinced he was gonna he was just gonna chase me i was convinced that he wasn't gonna let me go so i've ran and because i could run um i remember looking over to the left and seeing two people walking walking or walking a dog near the river and then my embarrassments will hit me oh my god i'm naked so as i came up to this there was a grassy mole like a hill that went up and then over to the swing and i thought if anybody's by the swing i've got no clothes on they'll all take the piss out of me you know what i mean I, that's how i felt i was petrified but i didn't know what to do so I didn't look over my shoulders. I was convinced he was chasing me. So as I got to the grassy mole, I just slowed down a little bit and pulled my shorts on. I ran over and thank God there was no one at the swing. No kids were there because it must have been about 8, 8.30 in the summer. So it was evening time. So I ran and I hid behind the rope swing. The, the swing, the tree was a massive tree that was throwing. I hid behind there um, just looking to see if he would come and he never came, which was... So I'd left my, my running vest and my trainers and my socks in his flat. But I didn't care about that. I'd managed to get away from him. So I stayed there for a sort of five or 10 minutes and, and he never came. And um, so to my relief, I was sort of, I was able to try to comprehend what had happened. Um, I, I still was in shock if I think, if I look back at it, I was, I was completely shocked at what he'd done to me, you know. Did you tell and anyone? Not at that time. Not at that time. I remember washing myself in the river um, because his cum had dried on my chest and on my face. 
and I was shocked because I couldn't get it off, and I was panicking because I was thinking if I if when I go home, if my mum's my mum sees me, she's gonna she, you know she's gonna put two and two together, and then I'm gonna really get in trouble. Do you know what I mean? So I tried to get it off the best I could, but I, it wouldn't all come off. Um, Hope you're enjoying the podcast. Here's a word from our sponsor, Harry's. Having such a scratchy face, I'm always delighted to get a new Harry's set. There's a foaming gel, hydrating night lotion, and the razor with the weighted handle really gets the job done. The trimmer blade makes it so easy to get into those tricky places to reach. The shave gel offers effective lubrication and just comes off like butter. It's such a smooth shave. It shaves fast, efficiently, no discomfort, and it is so smooth by the end. The hydrating night lotion is light and non-greasy. Harry's is doing a zero pounds trial. Start shaving with the products, just pay for delivery. Save every time. Save on all your shaving products without sacrificing quality. You're in control. You can modify or cancel your plan from the account page. Make sure to support our podcast and start your own skincare journey by redeeming a free Harry's trial set. All you cover is £3.95 for delivery. Just head to harrys.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N, and have your trial set delivered to your door. That's harrys.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting our sponsor. So from the rope swing, you went through an alleyway and we lived on this crescent, a big crescent, um, with loads and loads of council houses. And there was garages that ran down the back of my mum's house. So I, if I was ever in trouble, I would scoot over the garages, sneak in the back door, and my mum's lounge was to the left, to the left of the stairs, and the door was always closed. So I sneaked in. I remember climbing over the garages. I remember because I was my feet were in agony because the garage top of the roof, the ca- top of the garage roof had stones on it, and I remember trying to tiptoe across. F- things that stick in your mind are quite funny. So. I managed to get indoors, get upstairs and have a bath and get changed. And he said to me that, and I wrote that in the book, which was, which, and I said this in court, which really upset me was the fact that he blamed me. He said that I was a little prick teaser. I'd gone around here in my running vest and my shorts and I was teasing him. Um, And he, before the first, when he slapped me the first time, he said that this is all your fault you've asked for this, you've, you've come around. And I, was, I stood there for a couple of seconds thinking, how have I teased you? I didn't understand what he was going on about. Do you know what I mean? He said, you're just a little scumbag. He said, I'll never forget, I'll never forget the next thing he said, no one will believe you. And if you tell anybody, if you tell anybody, I will kill you. <clears throat> That's exactly what he said. And I thought, I wasn't getting out there anyway, so I was, why did you say that? Because for that split second, I couldn't work out, my head was gone. You weren't letting me go, yet you're telling me you're gonna kill me if I tell anyone. So it was like, he was playing with my mind. It's, do you know what I mean? So I never told anybody for a few days. I just carried on as normal. My mum never cared about anything anyway, and she never spoke to me. I spoke If my mum spoke to me two words in one day, sometimes it was probably not true to tell you the truth. She wasn't interested what I'd done or where I went. You know, I was, I was a little urchin, I was a street urchin, that's what I was. Um, so uh, I used to help Harry at the oil yard um, and we used to do the paraffin round. If anybody remembers the old days, with the paraffin round, you'd knock on people's doors and you'd fill their, paraf- their little cans up, jerry cans with paraffin and they were paraffin heaters. So during the summer, we didn't do paraffin, we'd, we'd go out in the lorry and we would we would um, all over London, and we'd you know we'd do all the burn ins in the hospitals, and we'd fill up their their tanks with gas oil for the for the for the hot water and stuff. So Harry knew me really well. He's a lovely, lovely man, um, a lovely man. Um, and he said, uh, "What is the matter with you?" And I said, "No, no, nothing, Harry, no, nothing." He said, "Paulie, there's something wrong with you. You are not yourself. What's wrong?" He said, "Is your mum?" giving you grief again. I said, no, no. I said, Harry, I'm not, I can't say nothing. I said, if I say something, he'll kill me. And then I was like, why did I say that? I'll never forget that. Why did, and he said, who will kill you? He said, you tell me. And I told him. And he, yeah. The rest of that day, Harry went really quiet. 
and he had a the, he had the, he was the loveliest little man. He had a big round face. It was only little, but his laugh was just he'd laugh and he'd laugh on his feet. Do you know what I mean? And when he laughed, I laughed, and he was just such a lovely person. But he really went quiet on me. And if people went quiet on me as a child, I always thought I'd done something wrong because I was always in trouble. Do you know what I mean? And I said to Harry that day, I said, "Have I upset you, Harry? Have I done something wrong?" And he said, "No, mate. No, 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 no." He said he shouldn't have done that to you. He said, and he was, and he first time that anybody had ever done it, he cuddled me, and he was really sorry. And I didn't notice how how serious this was. I knew it wasn't right, you know, and I knew, I knew it was. It, of course, I knew it was wrong, but I didn't realise how wrong. We no one had taught us anything about. No one had taught us anything about these people. My mum certainly didn't, so we never knew anything about it. So for Harry, so for Harry to do that, I sort of, I thought this this is it didn't feel right everything my head was scrambled I, my emotions were all over the place and i didn't know what to do but i prom but he promised me he wouldn't tell. i said harry you can't tell anybody you'll kill me if you do he said he'll kill me um so please you can't no nope. he said, assured me he wouldn't tell anybody no nope. i said okay, okay harry he said it's our secret it's our secret isn't it and he said paulie i won't tell anybody I'll never forget it he said no it, you know so at least then I felt a little happier when I left work that night. Do you know what I mean? And and um, I uh, a couple of weeks later, a couple of weeks went by, and I saw that he ate. Nigel had a green Land Rover, an old fashioned green Land Rover with a flatbed on the back. And um, he uh, every time I saw this green Land Rover, I would dive behind a car because I was convinced that he would do what he said he was going to do. He never tried to find me. He never came back over the swing. In fact, I became a bit of a recluse then. I never, I never went out very much. I was petrified that he was going to kill me, like he said. So I would never go anywhere near that area. Do you know what I mean? If I went out, I went out somewhere else. Do you know what I mean? If I went to school, I went the other way to school and I went into the back entrance. I never went in the front entrance. I stopped going around for Alison. Alison, um, Alison Sell, I stopped going around for her and I wouldn't go anywhere near the flats because I was petrified. Um, and then I got in from school about two, I'd say two or three weeks later, and I walked in and there was a policeman sitting there. And my mum sitting there with a face like thunder. Sit down, she said. And I was like, what's going on? So she said, this policeman wants to have a chat with you. So I said, okay. So I said, I'm thinking, what have I done? Like, I'd get up to a little bit of mischief. Do you know what I mean? You nick a couple of bottles of milk or, you know, when you're a kid, you get up to, you know, I thought, oh God, I've, I've been caught doing something. Um, and he asked me um, who Nigel was. And I was just froze. And I said, to, I said to this policeman, can I talk to you on your own? I didn't want my mum in on this. But her exact words were, and I'll never forget it, sit down, you little bastard. Sit down, you little bastard, tell me what's going on. He wants to ask you questions. So he said to me once again, can you tell me who Nigel was? I've, I've got a report. A man called Nigel was, has interfered with you. <laughs> And my mum has got a face like thunder. Now you would think, wouldn't you, if it was your son, and the, and you have been in, the police are saying that you've been interfered with, that you would be concerned? No, not her, not at all. So she's sitting there with a face like thunder. So I'm petrified. Don't know what to do. So I've had to tell him, but I didn't go into detail. I was too embarrassed, and to this day I'm still too embarrassed. When I was in court, it, it it's you know, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. He'd done other things to me that I can't, I'm too embarrassed to tell you. Amy knows, um, but I've never told anybody else. Anyway, so I'm trying to say to this this policeman that, you know, it's yes, he did. He touched me, and you know, how long have you known him? Where does he live? Blah blah blah. So I gave the police all the information that I enough information, and I. But I'm like, how do they know? I didn't think that Harry would say I really didn't give it a thought Harry promised me he wouldn't tell anybody and I'd never told anybody else I never told Harry the details I just said that we played a wrestling game and he'd he touched me up and stuff I never told him I've never told anybody what they'd done I never certainly told the police that he had raped me so anyway um, the policeman went said he'd be in touch um, so I tried to leave the room and go upstairs my mum's like you're lying, little bastard. What's happened? You, you're, you filthy little this. You're filthy little. And I'm like, and I lost my temper with my mum, which you could never do, because if anything, she had anything in her hands, you got it. Do you know what I mean? So if she had something lively, something you should fry, you should beat you with it. She was, 
she was a nice piece of it, but all, all she was, all she was embarrassed that the police had been in the house. She didn't care about me. She didn't care that this man had done what he did to me. She wasn't concerned at all. I'll never forget it. And I screamed at her. He had fucking sex with me. I'm not a filthy little bastard. He had sex with me. I've been working with him. Who is he? Who is he? I've been working with him for about 18 months, two years. I can't remember the exact what I said to her, but I've been working with him a long time. Ask Alison's mum. So I sort of kept saying, because she knew of Alison's so Ask Alison's mum. She'll tell you. She'll tell you. You little bastard. Anyway, I got a proper, proper good eye in that night for my mum because I dared stand up to her and tell her the truth. So basically, her husband then came in, um, who I hated. He's a nasty piece of work. Um, we never got on. I couldn't stand around. He walked on, and he was another bully, horrible bully. Um, ended up having words, well, more than words with him. And consequently, um, after getting kicked around the floor a little while, I managed to get out of the house and I ran away. I phoned my social worker, told him what had happened, and he come he came and got me. In them days, you could reverse charge calls. Do you remember, you put your money in the telephone box, you could make a reverse charge. If you didn't have money, you could phone the operator and make a reverse charge call. So I re reversed the charges and spoke to him, and I said, look, this is what's happened. He came and got me, and I stayed the night at his house with his wife and his children. He was a man of the, man of the cloth, evidently. I'll tell you about more of that, that later. So anyway, um, consequently, then I was went back into care for a while, and... The police never done anything about it. And I went round to Harry's yard um, and said to him, Harry, you, the police know, like, the police know, how do they know? How do they know? And I was upset. I was, and, he, and he cut, and again, no one ever cuddled me. No one ever showed me any real affection, but he was so sorry. And he, and he apologised. He said, I wish I could, I wish I could look after you. I wish I could take you away from all this, but I can't. Do you know what I mean? And, um, and he said, I told them, I'm sorry, I had to, I had to tell them. So, at least he was honest with me, the only person that probably was at that time. So um, nothing ever happened. The police done nothing. They obviously, if they interviewed him, I'll never know. They said that they did. My social worker said that they did. But nothing ever happened. It was just completely and utterly brushed under the carpet. So I just carried on, just put it at the back of my mind and just went back, was back to living with my mum for a while. You know, and just, yeah, just carried on. That was it. And put it to the back of my mind and just had to. Did you run into him anywhere? Never saw him again. Because I was in and out of care. And the problems then really started for me after that. And I didn't realise why. But I think the horrors of what he had done, my trust was, I didn't trust as it was. But then I didn't trust anybody. And then I, I got expelled from school shortly afterwards. My first high school, I, that I got expelled probably four or five months afterwards. I, you know, I had a running with a teacher that I didn't get on with, and you know, again, no one there to protect you. Nobody cares. Nobody cared in them days, and corporal punishment was a part of life in them days. You know how it was. Do you know what I mean? It's just like you know, but he was very handy with his. You know what I mean? And he, you know, anyway, I, I won't go into details about that, but safely to say I ended up having a fight with my teacher and I got expelled. They believed him over me. So my, so my life was going in a downward spiral after that, you know. Um, a lot of survivors of these things because they're not given the tools to deal with it, get on drugs to self-medicate. Mm -hmm. Did you end up on the, the drugs path? No, no, no. never. I, I had athletics. I had sport. That's good. And it doesn't matter what ever happened to me, even though I... Even though I had a, I did have a nasty temper, and and I did become, I was I was always kind. I was never a wrong one in that respect. I, I wouldn't, I'd never bully anybody. I hated bullies. I hated bullies because my mum bullied me and her partners bullied me. I would never. I hated bullies, so I would never be that. No, I found sport, and I still had Harry in my life, who was a massive, massive part of my life. I still worked with him on on the oil round, um, and I. I filled my life with sport and I went to a, a school a, after that. The only school that took me was because of my athletic ability. That became apparent. And this school was um, was big on sport. So they'd raced me many times when I was at my first school and none of their athletes could get anywhere near me. So for me to go there, I did actually become a, a very good athlete after that. So no, I consciously, all the time, this is why now to this day, if I have any stress in my life, sport is my saviour. Definitely. I don't need endorphins from drugs. 
I don't need them sort of endorphins. Sport has been my saviour. Yeah, that's yeah. one thing we're trying to tell the young people as well. Just get yeah. into sports, yeah. you know. Yeah, definitely. So how did it flare up again with this person? Um, it must have been many years later. Many years later, many, many years later. I, To be honest with you, I, my son was born when I was 20, 2021. My Joseph was born... Um, and he became my sole focus. You know what I mean? Unfortunately, when my marriage failed, um, nothing it wasn't her fault. It, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, my ex-wife wasn't, it was nothing. It wasn't her fault at all. It was the damage that had been done to me. I know this now because I've had counseling for, from Survivors UK. Um, and it, had I had counseling in the early years, probably where I wouldn't, you know, I'd, you know, people wouldn't have suffered the way they did. I wouldn't let anybody close to me. So, uh, my marriage failed basically, but my son was my my sole focus. As my ex wife said to me, it's such a shame that you was married to Joseph. You was never married to me. And as I wrote in my book, my second book, she could have been the Queen of Sheba, she could have been Marilyn Monroe, she could have been Princess Diana, all rolled into one. It wouldn't have made any difference. I wasn't capable of of love. I wasn't capable of it, and because of what had happened, and I do know that now because my counsellors have told me why you never addressed it. And it, and one thing my counsellor did say, which really, really resonated with me was, there's a certain part of the brain as a child grows up, and it's scientifically proven that if a child under the age of 15, 16 suffers physical, any one of these three, physical abuse, mental abuse, sexual abuse, it damages a part of the brain and later on in life, you do it, it, it becomes apparent and you do struggle with certain things relationships uh, you turn like, turn to drugs like you say you become an alcoholic or whatever to to override this problem and unfortunately Guiana was the loveliest loveliest man he's the only man I trusted as a counselor he, he was a, an amazing person survivors UK are unbelievable to trust me and he said unfortunately Paulie you've had all three um, and I have been diagnosed um, in the last few years um, with uh, severe, pe you know, post-traumatic stress. I don't listen. What have I got to moan about, truthfully? You know what I mean? Um, um, but people like Survivors UK, honestly, he taught me so much about myself. So unfortunately for my wife at the time, and it wasn't her fault, um, we probably weren't compatible, if I tell you the truth, but it, it didn't stop her. She's a, a, a lovely human being and she's a very lovely person. It wasn't her fault. It was my fault. I pushed everybody away from me, but my son, I didn't because he was mine. And he, so to, so to have your child, like Amy's got a little boy and it's the same for her. Um, they, they need you, they cling to you. They, you, you know, you want, you, I didn't want my son to have the life I had. So I was gonna do everything in my power to make sure he never had my life. So he became my main focus, which to be honest with you, probably saved me from a lot of stuff. So, so having him early, I never regretted it. All my mates were off clubbing in IB for and doing all their thing. And but Joseph was my focus and he was my pure and utter hundred percent. The minute that boy was born, he was my world, you know. And, and so everything else was, there was no way I was going to think about Clayton. That was in the back of my mind. I was never, once I'd locked him away, I'd locked him away. I didn't even want to think about him, but he was affecting me, but I just didn't realize it. Yeah, it's inside you, isn't it? Unresolved. Mm. So how did Nigel Clayton then come back into your life? Well, my son uh, was a very successful motocross rider. Um, we started riding bikes when he was five. And then we started racing club level. Um, and then he would climb the ladder, climb the ladder, climb the ladder. And he got very, very good. He was a very, very talented motocross rider. So we would travel all over Europe, the UK. We'd ride national level. We raced in Australia, America. We went all over the world racing. I spent, you know, spent all my time with him chasing his dream. He was also, academically very really clever clever boy i never was so we and his mum you know it's not all down to me his mum pushed him as well he went to a very very good school um when he was 16 he wanted to quit and go to america and race motorbikes and i said no and i said no you're not going at 16 you can get your a levels so when he was 18 he finished his a levels and i promised him he could go to america and fulfill his dream he wanted to race motorbikes in america he wanted the american dream so i promised him he could I couldn't go back on that promise. I'd hope he'd go to university. I'd hope, you know, he was clever enough to do anything he wanted to do. But no, 
motorbikes was his thing. So I had to fulfill what I'd said. So he went off to America and I didn't realize the week after he'd gone, my whole world collapsed. Totally, totally. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't drink. It, it was gone. And of course I was separated from his mum. We were still friends, but obviously, you know, she had her life, I had my life. So I, um, I didn't know what to do. I was just, was, I was, for the first time in my life, I was actually depressed. I would pull, the, pull my, my work truck over and just cry. A song would come on the radio, remind me of him. And I would be constantly, you know, wondering what he was doing. Cause he always needed his dad. You know what I mean? He needed me always. I was always there for him. If he'd done anything, I helped him achieve it or I would take him here or take him there. I was a bit overpowering to be truthful. I well, that focus took yeah. your mind off that. Yeah, definitely. So when he was 18 and he, off he went to America and my world fell apart and my friend, a dear friend of mine, Penny, a lo lovely, I've known her since we were children. She said to me, Paulie, you've had such an interesting life. She said, just write your memoirs, it'll help you. So I started writing this, and um, which wasn't going to be a book. And three years it took me. So every time I'd drive around at work or something, a record would come on and I'd, I'd remember something and I'd write it down. I was just a scrap of paper. So every day I'd go home and it really, so I focused more on writing and I really enjoyed it. I'd, you know, as I say, I can't, <laughs> I'm useless and I, at social media and stuff, I'm rubbish. I can't type, I can't use computers. I'm not gonna lie to you, I struggle. Mm -hmm. But Amy, she's amazing and she helps me, you know, come in here, she had to, in my phone, put, in, put the sat nav in because <laughs> I couldn't even do that, I'm rubbish and I. So anyway, um, yeah, so I wrote the memoirs and then, she, and then Penny said to me, did you ever finish them? And I said, yeah. So she said, do you mind if I read them? I said, of course you can. So I'll give her this A4 pile of paper. I said, the spelling's terrible, Pen, but you're welcome. So she took it to Spain with her and she, she, she got back off holiday and she said, you know, St. Paul, she said, I started reading it at three o'clock in the afternoon around the pool. And she said, two bottles of wine and two boxes of Kleenex later, she said, I'm still reading it. I'm crying, I'm laughing because I know you. She said, but we didn't have a clue what you went through as a kid. We always knew you on the manner as funny, always energetic, always up to mischief, always, but everybody loved you. You was just one of us. We was just like, well, you know what I mean? But we never had a clue what was going on in that house. We didn't have a clue. So she says, you should publish this. And I said, no, you're in no way. I'm not interested. So cut a long story short, Martin Goldman, who's a very, very, very dear friend of mine, he read it and he was part of a company called Mardi Books. Um, and he said, you've got to publish this. And I was like, no way, I am not. And he said, look, we changed the names and places. We changed your name from Paul Stevens to Paul King. No one will know, you won't get in any trouble because there's stuff in there that could get me locked up. Trust me, what I got up to as a kid, do you know what I mean? And, um, but so we changed names of places. Anyway, cut a long story short, it came out. Um, and to my surprise, I was getting five star ravings, five stars. I was like, geez, this is unreal. I was actually shocked. And um, Martin was excited and, you know, however, he was, and he said he'd, 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 um, he'd interviewed up to 2,000 known persons in the south of England over 13 years and he was no nearer to finding him. And if I could give him the person in my book, he could either eliminate him from his inquiries or take it further. And I said to him, I'm not interested. And he said, what do you mean not interested? I said, I've never spoke about it since it happened. I said, the police never believed me in 1977, so what makes you think you're gonna believe me now? And he's like, it's different now. I said, no, it's no different. I said, it happened and you turned your back on me, you weren't interested, none of you cared. So don't sit there now and tell me you didn't. He was actually genuine. And he said, listen, he gave me his card. He said, if you find out anything, you get a name, just let me know. That's all he said. And I was like, okay, thank you ever so much. So, you know, I'm always genuine and nice. He was a nice person. I know he was only doing his job, but I wasn't interested. I'm like, nah, I'm not having him. And um, it was like karma. And you know saying, and I'll go back to what happened with Clayton all them years ago, when I sat behind, and this is the truth, when I sat behind that tree and I remember trying to get it off my chest, I had just had a feeling that day, and this is, and you say, no, it can't be true, but it is true. I always knew one day, so I just had a feeling that one day this was gonna come back. I don't know how I could tell you, but I just had a feeling. So a month after I'd, give, I'd spoken to this detective, he said, uh, my, my wheel bearing went on my van and um, I phoned my pal up at the garage. I said, Steve, can you fix my van? Yeah, yeah, drop it off, Paulie. Lovely fella. So I threw my bike in the back of the van. I dropped it to the garage and I cycled back. 
And as I cycled, I cycled past the flats where it all happened. And I heard a lawnmower going. This is a gospel truth. And it's all, and this was in court. So this, this is all, this is gospel, gospel truth. And I, I, a chill ran down my spine because I heard this lawnmower going and I used to help him do the lawn. So I wasn't big enough to push the lawnmower, but I'd help him. Do you know what I mean? Like he was just grooming me, but I didn't know. So I turned around, I went in and there's a young lad pushing the lawnmower and he takes his earphones off. He says, you all right, mate? I said, yeah. I said, uh, he said, can I help you? I said, yeah, is Nigel about? I suppose Nigel's around, is he? He just, just blagged it really. And he said, uh, no, he ain't around. I said, oh, do you know, is he still about? He said, yeah, I work for him. I said, what, Nigel lives in that flat? He said, yeah, he said, yeah, he still owns the flat. He said, don't live there anymore. He said, uh, who are you then? I said, oh, I'm an old friend. I said, I blagged it, basically. I said, I'm a, I said, I'm an old friend, come back from Australia. I said, I don't suppose you could give me his number, do you? I'd like to catch up with him. No, he said, sorry, mate, really private. He said, don't give his number to no one. And I thought, yeah, I bet he don't. Do you know what I mean? So it's sort of a penny drop that he was still around. And I thought, I just had a feeling. So I said, uh, oh, that's a shame. I said, I'd like to have, uh, like to catch up with him. He said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, I've got to speak to him. And he gave me the phone. He went, Nigel, have got someone here to talk to you. What was I going to do? What was I going to do? I had to flag it. I had to oh, get through shit. it. So he's given me the phone. Now, I haven't seen that man since he did what he did to me. Now I've got him on the phone. Hello, Nigel. He said, who's this? I said, hello, mate, it's Paul. Paul, Paul, Paul. I said, you remember Paulie? I said, uh, I wonder if you're around for a, for a coffee, you know, for a chat. Yeah, you got the wrong person, mate. I said, no, 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 I've got, definitely got the right person. It's Nigel, isn't it? He said, yeah, it is, yeah, yeah. He said, no, you've got the wrong person, mate. I said, no, it's Paul. He said, I don't know any Paul. He said, yeah, it's Paulie. Do you remember me, 1977? Do you remember me now? He went, I got, I got someone on the phone. Put the phone down. Mm. So I'm thinking, oh, I want to get, now, now I've got the bit in my teeth. I want him. I want him. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, nah, I'm having this. So I says to this young lad, uh, oh, he's at the guy, he's got someone on the phone. I said, you sure you can't give me his number? No, he said, it'd be more than my job's worth to give his number out. He said, uh, I said, oh, that's a shame. I said, I'd like to have surprised him. I, I said, look, I said, is he still down at, um, I've, I don't know why I've done it. And he went, I went, yeah, by the, uh, he said, by the college, you know. <laughs> don't say the name. <laughs> no, I'm not allowed to say the name. I apologize about that. I said, is he, yeah, he said, round the back there, you know. I said, oh, he's still there, is he? I just blagged it. So I knew exactly where it was. So I said, okay. I said, look, I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, I'll just surprise him. It'd be nice to see him again. All of a sudden, I saw the look on this kid's face change. Now, let's tell you about this kid in a minute. It turns out that this kid, this kid was part of his little yeah. ring. And have you said his name, the kid? No. Nah. No. Okay. No, um, no, nah, nah, I just said a member of Parliament's but office. It was okay. literally... Yeah, um, he rented Nigel's an office. office was right next door to this member of parliament's office. Mm -hmm. Who and he Nigel rented. Nigel was quite sort of um, known in the community. He was quite, you know, he came to, sorry. Yeah, he was quite known in the community. He came to even where I worked and spoke with my boss about doing his um, accounting and things like that. So he was very well known. The member of parliament knew him. Member well, of parliament, you should do with him. He used to come into my work. Because I was working at a local restaurant at the time, he used to come in with boys all the time, you know. And we always thought, mm, but, you know. But once you put to it, once it all came out, you're like, why didn't we say something, you know? Yeah. But yeah, yeah he was very respected in the community. Very respected. Yeah. And yeah, it's only afterwards I found out how yeah. respected he was. Everybody, even the local, even the local post office, which is only a few doors from where you worked, lovely people, Indian people, beautiful people. Um, she was horrified. She was so apologetic to me when she knew it was me that he'd abused. And oh, after yeah. it had all come out, everybody was just so shocked. So shocked. They was just like, oh my God, we just didn't have a clue. You so did I mean? you show up in? So I then thought, right, and I am a I'm murder. If I get saying, if I get a bit between my teeth, I thought, nah, I'm not having this. So I jumped on my push bike and I saw the look on this kid's face and I knew he was going to phone him. So I jumped on my push bike because I'm a fitness freak. Of course, I could do three miles on a push bike in about eight minutes. Do you know what I mean? So I've shot over there, gone down the side of the alleyway by this shot uh, by this office, and there was a, a, a it, in court they they in court they called it the um, stable yard. Mm -hmm. It's an old Victorian stable yard, big high walls all the way around it. There was a massive green gate. It must have been twenty foot long by three meters high. Barbed wire fences all around the top no buzzer you could not get in this place so i banged on the gate 
nothing. And I thought, oh, he knows I'm coming. He knows. He must have been so worried. Because all of a sudden, his world must have come crashing around him. Because all of a sudden, I'm on the phone. Remember Paula, 1977. So again, I blagged it. I just wanted his number so I could give it to the police. I really wanted to do that. And uh, so I went into his office. And I said to the woman beyond, the, the, a, a lovely old lady, well, middle-aged. And I said, uh, she said, oh, well, hi there. And I said, hello, sweetheart. I said, uh, I've just come for a job interview with Nigel there. I said, and I've left his phone number on the bus, but on a scrap of paper. I said, I really need this job. I said, you wouldn't give me his number, would you? So I can phone him. She said, yeah, of course I will. So she wrote his name, Nigel Clayton. And I never knew his name was Clayton. <laughs> and she wrote his phone number down. And I thought, I've got you. Wow. Now I've got you. Wow. Yeah. Hope you're enjoying this podcast. There's a word from our sponsor, Rocket Money. The other day, I had to cancel free Amazon Prime memberships. I had a personal on the UK, Amazon, US, Amazon, company account, US, Amazon, UK, Amazon. Do you understand how hard it is to cancel these bloody things? That's why Rocket Money makes these things so much easier, formerly known as Truebill. The app shows all your subscriptions in one place and cancels what you don't want for you. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were paying for. Just like with me, with my four Amazon Prime memberships, you may find out you've been at least double charged for a subscription. To cancel a subscription, all you've got to do is press cancel and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Cancel unnecessary subscriptions with Rocket Money today. Go to rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Seriously, it could save you hundreds per year that's rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting our sponsor, Rocket Money. Links in the description box. Cheers. Anyway. And when, when you were writing that book then, just to go back a bit, because you've buried it for so long and then yeah. you're writing it, didn't that bring it back and that traumatize you some more? Well, what happened was, at the time, I had a bit between my teeth. I just wanted to give the police's number. If I tell you the truth, my foster mum, God rest her soul, she died last year. She was lovely, my, my foster mum, Pat. Um, and I told, I didn't talk to many people, but I talked to Pat. And I told Pat that the police had been in, and, and I said, I don't want nothing to do with it, Pat. And she sat and she was the loveliest lady, and she said to me, Paulie, I knew I'd fostered you when you was 15. My coach had died. I went back into care, and then she fostered me. And she turned out to be the mum that I never had. I absolutely worshipped her. Mm. And... Um, and she said, Paulie, I knew something had happened to you. She said, I just knew. She said, you've got to do this because you're not the only one. And I told her, and she said, you, you've got to do this for all the other victims. She said, I'm telling you now, they don't stop with just you. She never knew what he had done. I hadn't told her the details because it was too horrific. But, and I thought, you know saying you're right. For, so for the first time in my life, I'd sort of, it come to the, it come to the forefront. So when I gave the police his number, and I was like, whoa, this wasn't part of the deal here. You've asked me for a name and a number, I'll give it to you. I said, mate, you're asking too much. I don't want to do this. I don't, do you know saying? It was the embarrassment. I didn't want people knowing. I was respected on the manor. I, you know, people know me and they respect me. I'm not a wrong and I'm kind, I'm caring. I trained the kids for 10 years. I didn't want them kids knowing. Their coach, who they respected, and I take them fighting, I take them boxing. We go to shows. We, you know, I had a couple of, you know, I had a, a national champion. I had boys in the semi-finals, you know, and they respected me. And I didn't want them to know what this person had done to me at that time. It was a mental thing with me. Do you know what I mean? So, and I said no. Nah. And he kept on and on. He said, "Listen, there's a team that will help you. There is a team that just still since the Jimmy Savile thing. There's a team now that will help you." And um, so I did. I went in and made a statement about what he did to me. And that was 2015. And that's when it all started. So, yeah, you're right. It did affect me, if I tell you the truth, badly. Um, yeah, really badly. And I didn't realise how badly. It's all come back. Yeah, to all the come back. So then I had to have counselling and they put... A lovely, lovely. The first, the first detective who looked after me, uh, and a girl called Zara, a lovely, lovely lady, um, and they overloaded her with work on this case because she didn't realise how big this case was going to get, and she just wasn't experienced enough. Because once they started delving into Nigel Clayton, and they knew that other people had reported him for the murder, and then they'd gone back through the files and they found that other people, and in court there were people that had made um, accusations against him from the nineties from the 80s 
2000s, but the police done nothing. So if you've got three or four people making accusations against the same man, nothing was done. It was only when I was in court I realised what a complete and utter fuck up. The, the police weren't, they just... Do you think he had some kind of protection because he was connected to politicians and possibly police I thought, as well? There's other people have said that. To be honest with you, I thought that at first, but it was only when, like Amy just said, he was so respected on the manor and he would help everybody. He, his web of lies was so tight. He, uh, he was some, he was, he was the biggest narcissist you could ever want to meet. Um, so no, I don't think he was protected. I just think he was very clever. And he only groomed and abused boys that had no real home life. They were troubled kids. Um, he would shower them with gifts. He would promise them this, he would promise them that. And, and he was connected. I, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna name names, but I was, I was threatened during the lead up to this inquiry. I had notes left on my van. I was, a, lo a, a friend of mine phoned me one day who is you know, quite, a, quite a face and quite a, a hard man and said, Paul, I need to talk to you. Like, what's going on? Why does Nigel Clayton want you hurt? And I was like, I can't tell you. And he said, well, there's a certain person on the manners in, was asked to sort you, but he, he knows you and you know him. I'm not going to name him. He's actually a very good friend of mine. And, um, and when Clayton asked him, because he used to do some collecting, for, that's, this is the sort of person you're dealing with. He used to do debt collecting for Clayton. Clayton had properties all over the place. And if you crossed him and you never paid him, this person would claim and get the money for him. He was a collector, but he knew me. He knew I was a boxer. He knew what I'd done and I knew his family and his friends. So he was like, why do you want him hurt? He's a nice guy. And he said, well, I can't tell you. He said, well, unless you tell me, I'm not even going to talk to him. So I got a message back to this person to tell, and I will use, I'm sorry I have to talk like this, but I was, I get angry when I think that this scumbag was trying to intimidate me. Do you know what I mean? Um, I'm not an old man, but I've boxed for 30 years. So I'm not frightened, do you know what I mean? But I'm not an hard man, it's be, you know, what's an hard man? There is no such thing as far as I'm concerned as being a decent human being. But when put, people push you into a corner, so I basically got a message back to him to tell Clayton to go fuck yourself. You, know, you will not intimidate me. And I gave the police the notes that were left on my van. Um, they pulled Clayton in again and they, of course they had no evidence it was him. So they couldn't, but they said to me, if we find out that you're intimidating witnesses, you will you go to prison now. So that's, so, you know. So he wasn't arrested right away, he's still running around. He was, he was investigated from 2015 and he was um, charged in 2020. Which is long, because of the- Five years, the because every time, and I was, forward. yeah, I was convinced he was, because, I, I, you know, I'm in Australia. I don't live in the UK, I live in Australia. So I'm, I'm talking to my, my the detective in England. Mm regularly and i'm like what's going on you know why is it you've you've told me you've got enough to convict him for just for what he did to me um why are you not convict and the, and what they kept saying was is the cps um other people kept coming forward and what the cps wanted and i didn't agree with it at the time but i do 100 percent now they wanted it all in one case they wanted it all in the basket together so they knew he wouldn't wriggle out of it this time. They said to me, if you go to court, even though you're a strong human being and you're, you know, um, you will be believed, he will only get four years for what he done to you. This, you know, so this man, you know, done yeah. the most horrific things to an 11 year old boy. He would have got four years because it was in 1977, a maximum. He probably would walked away with two years. You only get sentenced for what happened at the, what it would have been sentenced at that time. Right. Yeah. So yeah. because more victims were in the later years, yes. the sentencing had changed. changed. That's why he's concurrent. One victim got a hunt. He got hundred and sixty years for one victim. Good. One victim. What which year, is a do you very, know what year that that happened? That victim. That was a very very sad story. Um, I thought Clayton was a bad man. Obviously for what he had done to me, do you know what I mean? But when I went to court, I was the only person, when we went to court, because of COVID, you weren't allowed in the court. It was all behind screens and everything, but the, the judge was an amazing human being. She was lovely. Mm. And she made another court available for anybody that wanted to sit and watch it on screens. So because I'd come back from Australia, 
for this trial, I was determined that I wanted to see it every day. So I went to court every day. Every day I went and I took my book and I wrote every day. So I've got everybody's testimony. I know exactly what happened. So I got from the first victim to the last victim, I know in here and in the, what I've written, I know exactly what happened. The fourth, fourth victim, one, two, three, the fourth victim was 12, 12 years old at the time. He went to a funeral with his mother. Clayton was at the funeral. And within an hour, this young lad who had learning difficulties, he was, he was, um, mm. um, what was he? Uh, he had, uh, what's, autism. we had autism. He had learning difficulties. So within an hour, he had taken him to a wooded area and abused him. Mm. Within an hour of being at this funeral, it, it's so sad, this story. I can't name this person. Yeah, don't be, name any of the Because his mother, survivors. to this day, his mother doesn't know. No. He won't tell her. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. But he went on to abuse him for another 30 years. Because he of his learning difficulties, he kind of managed to entrap him. For a very long time. Yeah. yeah. So he entrapped him every every Friday. He would pick him up from boarding school mm -hmm. every Friday, take him back to his flat where he abused me, and ab and have sex with him. So this kid from twelve mm -hmm. to seventeen was being sexually abused, but he thought because he was he was um, troubled and he he had learned degrees, Nigel convinced him that they were boyfriends that he loved him. So Nigel would say to him, when we're out and there's people that you know, you're my friend, but when we're on our own, I love you and you're my boyfriend. So he abused him. When he left boarding school, his mum threw him out when he was. And she threw him out. This will get to you. This is, this is, a, this is horrific. He then went and stayed with Nigel mm. at Nigel's house with his wife. Yeah. What I'm about to tell you will shock you. I was shocked in court. I couldn't believe it. And I thought it was a lie because he stated this victim stated that he stayed with Nigel at his house. Um, the defense was so horrible to him. He still has learning difficulties to this day. He's a very nice person. I like him, even though he became an abuser. See the story. <sighs> he became an abuser with Nigel. So what happened was, what happened was, is he was abusing him. He went and lived with Nigel in his house, his marital home. He said in court and the, the, the defense said, you expect us to believe that you were sharing a bed with Nigel. Could you explain the layout upstairs? And she, he said, yes, there was a dark room where he, because Nigel took photos of us all. When he was arrested, when he was arrested, they went through his properties and they found thousands upon thousands of photos, indecent photos, child pornography, and it's it's rated one to four, four to eight, eight to twelve. They were eight to twelve. They were bad. And they many of bad. those boys haven't been identified. No. Have they? I had to sit down, go through these photos, didn't I? Mm. I had to go through these photos with the police, and they asked me, "Can you identify?" And I knew two of them, but I couldn't put a name to them because mm. it was back in the eighties and nineties. And I said, "Yeah, I know them two boys. Can you give me this? I'll get you a name." And he said, "We can't give you the photo. You're not allowed to leave the police station." I said, "Just give me the photo. I'll get a name for you. I know them. I know these two. And they were the same chair, the same bed, naked." He'd taken photos of us all. There was photos of us all. He had took photos of all of us, right? Yeah. So anyway, so the judge, so the, the, the defense said, to, um, so you expect us to believe that he slept, you, you slept in his bed and his wife was where? She said, well, there was a double bedroom, a dark room and a single bedroom. So you're telling me that the wife was in the single bedroom while you were sleeping in his bed. He said, yeah, that's right. It's true, yeah. And you expect us to believe that you're telling us now that he had sex with you most nights. And she said, he said, yes, that is true. And she said, and you state in your statement that you bled quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and he abused you with a police truncheon, mm -hmm. a wooden police truncheon. Depraved. I was horrified. I knew, I knew what he had done to me was bad enough. But he'd obviously moved on with how how deprived he was. He, he was he, he's, oh, it was horrendous. So oh, I can't say his name. Sorry. Um, Timestamp that. Yeah, I can't say his name. Anyway, he um, so he then said, she then said to him, but if his wife was in the room next door, surely she must have heard your screams. And he said, I did, did scream. Yes. So she said, well, 
for the sake of the court, could you scream? So this poor man is in this court and he's reliving what Nigel had done to him. Mm-hmm. So he put his hand over his mouth and he went, so she said, well, that's hardly screaming. He said, it is when you've got a head and a pillow. Mm. So she shot herself in the foot, didn't she? She yeah. completely shot herself in the foot because the jury, some of the jury were weeping. It was so horrible to see. And I felt so sorry for this person because he then, um, so she's, she then said, um, you know, it was a lie. You'd, you'd made all this up. It's a complete fabrication. My client has no knowledge of you. He said he looked, you stayed there one night when you were drunk. You worked for him. This is all a fabrication because his defense was this, there was a conspiracy. So we all got together in a pub over 44 years and said that Nigel Clayton had abused us all and we're going to make it all up because we want to get his money. We want to get his money. So that was their defense. It was, it was complete lies. We'd, all collaborated together to get his money because we want to sue him and um, it's a complete lie. That was his defense. So the 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 defense really crucified him that afternoon and he never came back to court the next morning. It was it was horrific. But what I'm led to understand is is for Clayton, who is who was his wife, who allegedly never knew that he was abusing boys. The next morning, she said to the police, I know this for a fact, that she was never going to say a statement. She was never going to turn on her husband. It was never going to happen. She then says afterwards she was in fear of her life. Next morning, we go into court, and I'll remember it to the day I die if the statement was read. The prosecution wanted the statement read. The defense didn't. And the statement was read by the prosecution to to the jury, and I'll remember it to this day. And it said, my name is Clayton. I've been married to Nigel Clayton for over 50 years. It's not been the happiest of marriages. However, I took my vows very seriously. Nigel claims he's a happily married heterosexual man with a daughter and a granddaughter. His daughter isn't his daughter. It's from a previous relationship. I can't say his name. He did come and stay with us when he was 17. He was a very troubled and angry young man. I did try and help him. However, it was very difficult when he was sharing a bed with my husband. So she has saved, then she said, she dropped but it, yeah. I was unaware, yes. I was unaware of any sexual activity going on. So she saved the bacon. She has basically, she knew what was going on. She tried to save herself because the herself. police told her that if she gets found that she knew the whole time, she would also be prosecuted. So she yeah, then she, had to yeah. release that statement she could to be try prosecuted. and save herself. And he turned up in a wheelchair yeah. nearly every day yeah. when he walked absolutely fine. Like I would see him walking past my works where he off- his office was so close and we'd take pictures, right? To send them to the police. Like he's not in, in a wheelchair. Because what happened was when he got charged, he was remanded because he was charged for numerous. I think there was nine of us in the end. There was more, but a few dropped out um, of before because it was supposed to be in the July the trial because of COVID, it was then April. I was convinced I went mad. I even sent the judge a letter saying, please, please, we can't wait any longer. If he catches COVID, basically he's going to die if he gets COVID. I didn't say that to the judge, but I was like, please, you have to get convict this man. You're giving him a license because he, Clayton knew he was going to get nicked. He knew he was going to go to prison. It was, there was too much evidence against him. He was still abusing up to 2018. Jesus Whilst he was under investigation, the police were investigating him. He was still abusing boys. I don't know because I was in court when they were giving their evidence. He was still abusing boys in 2018. Yet they, they charged him and then they reminded him. He turned up in court. He didn't plead straight away. He was clever because if he'd have pleaded straight away, he'd have had to stay in until the trial. But because of COVID and everything, he'd have been in a long time. He never pleaded, which went against him. That's why he got such a long sentence. He then turned up in court in a wheelchair and the, his defense was he can't go to, he can't make his hospital appointments. He's, he's ill, he's this, he's that. Well, Amy will tell you, he walked past the restaurant nearly every day, going to the post office and the local shops. He was a complete con man. I was in Australia and I got a phone call from Amy's boss who said to me, Paulie, what's going on? You told me he was in prison. I said, he's in prison. He said, he's not. He said, I've got a photo of him walking across the forecourt next to my, my shop. So I send them to me. So he sent me the photos of him and a young, another young lad who we know he abused, but he wouldn't turn against him. The police knew that he was abusing this other young lad. Anyway, cut a long story short. 
I had then phoned the police and sent the police the photos. I said, you told me that he is in a wheelchair and he cannot walk. I said, that was on the Wednesday. On the Friday, he's walking across a forecourt. I said, are you for real? I was fuming. I'm stuck in Australia. I can't get back because of COVID. I can't fly back to the UK. My mum was dying. My foster mum was dying. So, and I can't get back to the country. And this guy is just doing that to all of us. And I was said, to, I sent a letter to the judge begging her, please, please get this man off the streets. You're giving him a license to abuse. He's filling his boots. And he was, he was filling his boots. He was still at it. He was under curfew, but he was still at it. They said they found as well, like the boy's belongings, like passports, driver's licenses and his safe, right? Yeah. So they pr it was proper controlling them, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the boys he was abusing, he mm. kept their licenses, he kept their yeah. driver's licenses, he, he yes. released money to them when, you know, mm. a couple of the victims in the stable block, he had a bed. This is horrific. I won't name the victims. They're actually good friends of ours now. Yeah, we're we very we no, no, we're, we're very close now, and we've become very close. But we we all talk to each other, and we you know we meet up from time to time. Mm -hmm. And I try and help them as much as I can because I'm a, sort of a strong. Do you know what I mean? And they're more troubled than me. Do you know what I mean? Um, but he had a bed in the um, in his this compound. He had offices, but in the middle of these offices, he had a bedroom that you could get in from three doors, a metal bed, handcuffs chains and he raped one boy in there tied him to the bed kept him there all night abused him buggered him mm. badly and then let him go in the morning um kept him all night i think he got about 65 years for that for that for that person was that during the time when the police could have took him off the streets uh, yes mm -hmm. that was after 2015 that's insane. Isn't 2015. It? So from insane. 2015 to 2000, they've got proof to 2018, 19, he was still abused. They could have had him on remand. They remanded with, him with and no, then they let him out. But I mean, with no bail, just yeah. kept him in yeah. while they built their and, case. And that's why I sent a letter to the judge begging her. I knew what was going on. I knew this person. I knew what he was doing. And I said to, in the letter, I said, you're giving him a license to carry on. He's filling his boots because he knew he was going to go to prison. He knew the time was up. Mm -hmm. They knew. They arrested him on, a, on the tarmac at Gatwick when he flew back into the country. They arrested him. So during the legal proceedings, did you have to face him? Legal proceedings, um, I had to, he, we had a lineup, I had to identify him, but he kept refusing. And the police said to him, right, the third time, if you do not go to this lineup, um, we'll arrest you. You have to by law. So he said, uh, or we, we send, you send us in three photos from three decades. So he's supposed to send three photos in, but he sent the worst photos you could ever imagine. You would never have identified him. Remember, it was 1977 that he'd done to what he did to me. But I knew I would know him. I knew, I just knew. So when I went to, I hadn't seen him, obviously, when I went to the, to the lineup, and I went to the lineup in Lewisham, um, I flew all the way from Australia for this lineup. And um, I walked in and there was the biggest black guy you've ever seen in your life. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say, I'm not racist, I love everybody, but the biggest black guy you've ever seen in your life is sitting there. That's his brief. They've sent this guy there to try and intimidate me. This is the truth. So the police said to me, okay, Mr. Stevens, we've got 12 photos for you to look at. If you can identify the person that abused you in 1977, could you pick him out? So this guy shook my hand. He didn't have to, but he's made a point of shaking my hand and he's trying to crush my hand. And I thought, you ain't intimidating me. You have come this far, it's not happening. So I thought I'm gonna make you earn your money. So I knew straight away it was number four. Straight, as soon as I looked at it, that's Nigel Clayton, I knew. And I said to the, the cop, I said, oh, okay, Mr. Stevens, do you know the person that abused you in 1977? I said, do you mind if I have another look? And he's like, yeah, no problem. Take your time, go through them again. So I had another look. And I said, I'm still not sure. Can I have another look? Yeah, of course. And I made him sit there for 20 minutes while I went through these photos. I knew who he was. I thought, I'm really going to, so I said, no, it's number four. And I turned around and just looked at this guy, just winked at him, just to say, I'll let you know that I'm not intimidated. Listen, he would have crushed me with his hands. He was that big, do you know what I mean? If he'd have wanted to, but it's all intimidation by Clayton. This is what he does. He int he's intimidated every one of us, hasn't he? Yeah. Every single one of us is intimidated. Tried to intimidate, but he wasn't going to intimidate me. I wasn't going to have it. So, yeah. So that was the first time I'd seen his, his picture. Then during the, they let him out of prison and um, 
my friend who Amy worked for um, at the time, who owned this restaurant, he asked me if I, because I'm a builder, would I would I pay for the front? And I said, yeah, of course I will. I'll do because they was in lockdown. Then you could only have tables outside. So he said, outside is his restaurant. He wanted it all paved and looking nice. And so I said, yeah, of course I will. So I do done all the brickwork and paving for him, just as a favour. Who walked by? Twice, Clayton. Did he look at you? Didn't know who I was. I looked straight at him. How I did not. I just. I had. What to went through your head when you actually to, saw him? I wanted to kill him. I, I saw this man walking along, and and everything, everything came back. I wanted, to, and he was where you are. That's how close he was, and he was with the same boy that he walks around with oh. all the time. He employed this young lad to do his cooking, to drive him. We found this out afterwards in court that this young lad was paid, and this guy was a character witness for Clayton. But everybody knows, and I know people that know this young lad that Clayton's been for years. He's been working for him for years, but he's a very timid, doesn't say much, always head down, hunched shoulders. So yeah, so when I saw him, it was it was yeah, it was pretty horrendous. What year was that? That was two thousand and. That was just before the trial, wasn't it? Because I came, when did I come back to England? It was about March, April, 2020. Yeah, 2020, I came back to England for the trial. Um, so I got back a month before the trial, I had to work with the police. And then my friend had asked me to do this work for him. And I said, yeah, I said, look, I'll do it for you. Just as, you know, it was a favor, something to do, to be honest, take my mind off things. Um, was and he, that, yeah. Was he putting a plan to go to flee the country or anything? Yeah, yeah, we found out that he, he uh, a lot of his, um, <clears throat> A lot of his uh, def uh, defense was that he, he had um, property in Guernsey. Um, and there's a couple of the boys he took to Guernsey and abused them in Guernsey. Mm -hmm. So he had 35 counts against him and he got convicted of 32, I believe. Was it 32? Yes, one Thir of the victims, um, the evidence was circumstantial or something. Yeah. They couldn't really, because he didn't actually abuse him, he managed to get away. So. That was the only one he didn't get uh, guilty for. But some of the others, they couldn't, some of the other counts against him were against him for the boy, but they couldn't convict him of them counts because he abused them in Guernsey and it was out of British jurisdiction. Yeah, he wasn't, yeah, he wasn't. Um, so so yeah. was that the trial you actually got to look in each other's eyes? I was the only, it was me and one other were the only two that would look, look at him. Everyone else had a screen around him. What was it like when he looked at you and he knew who you was? He wouldn't, he kept looking away, he wouldn't look at me. He wouldn't even look. He wouldn't even look at me. And I wanted to make eye contact with him. I wanted him to know that it was me that had done this. And this is why <laughs> this, this is why the defense had me back again in that dock numerous times. Cause they, the, the questions they were throwing at me were, were just so awful. Mr. Stevens, I put it to you, you're a compulsive liar. Mm -hmm. Your social worker never had sex with your mother. Your social worker was never your social worker. Your mother never abused you. You was never in care. And I just looked and I said, well, and I had to stay calm. And I just said, I said, well, that's your opinion. You're allowed your opinion, but shortly you will find out that what I'm saying is hundred percent true. He did abuse me. That man over there did abuse me when I was 11 years old. He did groom me when I was 10 years old and he did do them horrific things to me. And it, yeah, I said, no, I'm not lying. You wrote that book. <clears throat> your book is a complete fabrication of the truth. I said, is that right? She said, yes. I said, again, that's your opinion. That's your opinion. You're welcome to your opinion. She said, and I said, listen, and I said, I remember saying it to her and I remember the anger in her eyes. I said, I'm sorry, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't give you the answers you want, but I can only tell you from what I can remember. It was over 40 years ago that he'd done them things to me. I can't remember everything. And I'm sorry, I can't tell you what, what you want to hear, but what I'm telling you is the truth. And she was like, well, we'll see about that, won't we? We'll see if that's the truth. She said, I said, well, yeah, we will, but you will see that it is the truth. I said, he did do that to me. 100% he did. So I had to stay calm when really I wanted to run over and smash him to pieces, you know what I mean? Because I saw this little, this little frail old man and I was thinking, when I looked at him and I was just like, how was you so powerful? How was you so strong? I, I couldn't work it out because if you saw him, he was a wretch, wasn't he? He was such a wretch, wasn't he? He was an awful human being. Um, he was awful, so yeah. Did, did you think that the trial was going your way? No. 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 Uh, I mean, I, being an outsider looking in, I knew it was, you know, it was quite obvious that the jury and everybody believed exactly what the victims were saying. It was so obvious that they were, you know, um, but 
you doubted yourself throughout because I think what happened to you when you were a child when you weren't believed you you thought it was going to happen again he kept saying you know oh he's going to get off he's not going to get convicted it's just you know they're just going to drop it and then you know and I was like no have faith and w we spoke to a jury member do you remember the last yeah. the last day when he got found guilty when, yeah we and, left court yeah. didn't we do you remember then we, we left court you was with me that day wasn't we? we left court and there was a group of us there there wasn't too many people because we wasn't allowed to have many people in but um, Amy, bless her, she was she was rock solid through the whole thing, and you know, and she really helped me through it. Do you know what I mean? I used to talk to her regular, and, and she really helped me through it. Um, and the, the first time I, I, I it was a Thursday afternoon. I had an hour in the dock, and and she started firing in questions at me. She was very clever. She got your trust, and because I'd never done this before, but I'm quite a strong personality. She tricked me. She lulled me into a full sense of security and, and I sort of let my guard down a bit and then she hit me with a curveball, which sort of I thought went against me. Um, so I left court that afternoon and I said to you, you know, I've, I've messed this up. He's going to walk. I just, and I sat in the shower at two o'clock in the morning, honestly. I couldn't sleep that night. What did she, what has she said that tr uh, tricked you? I can't remember a hundred percent what it was, but it was something of, uh, it was something of, of, I can't remember a hundred percent what it was. She tricked me by, she lulled me in by sort of getting your confidence. She got my confidence and she she was being nice and smiley. I can't remember 100% what it was. I've got it all written down. And then she... I think it was something to do with the book. Was yeah, it? Yeah, it was the book. How you explained it. But the thing was, is that what you wrote in the book wasn't what happened. It wasn't everything that happened. Everything. No, it wasn't. She didn't want to write everything that happened. It's no, very brief in the book. But they pulled that apart so yeah. much. They had, it's like they you had, didn't say everything that happened no, in there. No, I didn't. I was too embarrassed. And I've said to you on this program, I, I haven't. And there's only one or two people that really know exactly. I won't go into detail because it's just, it, I, it's too, it's humiliating for a man to have to sit and, you know, tell the glory to But she picked up on that. And but why didn't you, you know, why didn't you say this? Why didn't you say that? And sort of, so I, I felt like she made me out to be a liar because I hadn't named, said everything that, that happened to me. I'd only said a certain amount and I felt that she'd undermine me. But because of the state I was in in my mind, I'd never done this before. Um, and I'm looking at 12 people that I never met before and they're, they're, they sit there and they obviously they don't say anything. They, they, the expression doesn't change. So you're wondering if they're believing you. And honestly, I've boxed for years. I mean, I've been in with some good fighters. I've sparred with top fighters and nothing compares to standing in that box and being cross-examined by Queen's Council. They're, they are absolutely, they go for the jugular, they don't care. So she lulled me into a full sense of security, then she hit me with a curveball. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was it was about the book that she had, I had A4 bits of paper in front of me. To the left was my, the book was chapter five and to the right of me was my police statement. So she was going from one to the other very quickly and she was trying to catch me out. So I had to be really on my guard and I really felt like I'd messed up. So, but I weren't allowed to talk to anybody. So when I left court, the judge said, you're not allowed to talk to anybody about the case. You're not allowed to, so I weren't allowed to talk to the police. My, my liaison officer, I wasn't allowed to talk to her. So I went home and I'm on my own and I'm like, I've messed this up. I've, I've, I've messed this up. I can't believe I've done this. This is the first day I've got, I've got days of this coming up. How am I going to get through it? And I'm not going to sit and lie to you. I, I sat in the shower at two in the morning, cried my eyes out and thought, I can't do this. Mm. Oh dear. And I didn't want to. Mm. I didn't want to go back. What was it like when the verdict came in then? Just, I cried. Mm. Relief. <laughs> yeah, I'm real. I couldn't, I couldn't, it was the first time in my life I didn't believe. My own mother didn't believe me. And if your own mum don't believe you, if you haven't got your mum batting for you, then what have you got? My social worker didn't believe me. He was too busy filling his boots on my mum. Do you know what I mean? That's the truth. Um, and I never told anybody else. Harry believed me, but there was nothing he could do. So for when the verdict came back, guilty. So all counts against me. I think there were six counts against me all guilty <laughs> um, and everybody else there's only one one victim was circumstantial that he didn't get the guilty verdict but all the serious ones guilty 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 like 32 out of 35 five counts guilty 
And um, mm. yeah, I just... And in that moment, because he had refused to speak throughout the trial, hadn't he? And then yeah. once he got found guilty, he wanted to say something. Yeah. Did he? He was didn't, he, he, didn't he, take, he didn't take the box. No, he wouldn't take the witness box. He wouldn't be cross-examined. Um, so when he got found guilty, the judge then said, okay, sentencing will be in a month, mm -hmm. which I was disappointed about. So take him down. So they took him down. And that was in the May. We had to wait till September till he was... So I was still in the country in September. So I'm still in the UK. I want, you know what I mean? So, so September, we go back to court. And the victim statements had to be read out. So the, the impact statements had to be read out um, to the judge, what he had done to us, what the impact it had made on our lives. And I wanted him to know. I wanted him to know it was me. I, I had to do it. So I want the, they, the, the, the prosecution said, do you want to read your statement or should we read it? Well, I'm the only one. So I stood up and I read my statement and I looked straight at him when I read it. And I said, the impact he had, not that he just hurt me, but the amount of other people in my life that had hurt because of what he had done to me. I'd hurt other people that tried to get close to me and couldn't get close to me and I'd hurt them. I'd push people away that didn't deserve that. And that horror, that, that's, that still hurts me today to think that people that were, you know, that, that were dear friends, um, people that, that had a right to be close to me, I couldn't show them the same. So I wanted him to know that. And I read this statement and I looked at him and he wouldn't look at me. And, it, and, he, and, and I said in my statement that I just wish that he would just apologize if he could stand up and say, I'm sorry for what, you did, what I did to you. Because I pitied him. I didn't hate him at that time. I pitied him. I thought, how can sexual lust, how can a desire to have sex with young boys to completely take over your life? How? I couldn't, under, I, and I actually pitied him. I felt sorry for him. I saw this frail old man who's gonna die in prison um, and other victims were so angry and they wanted to, they, you know, I mean, the, the trial was, end, it was it stopped very abruptly because one of the victims stood up and said, it's your fucking turn now. You're going to, you know, you're going to pay the consequences for what you've done. And now you're going to, you know, you're going to rot in there. And, and the judge just stopped the case, which was a shame because the judge was summing up at that time. And she, she said he was um, one of the worst that she had ever come across. She said, you only chose vulnerable young boys that had no, which made him 50 times worse. Um, that you took their lives, you took their souls. Do you know what I mean? Like basically you destroyed their lives. You showed no, you haven't showed an ounce of remorse due, during this trial. You have continually lied. She called him a narcissist, um, a, a compulsive liar. Um, he was only interested in saving his own soul. That's all he was interested in. And then she started handing down these Six years, eight years, 20 years, 31 years, 18 years, 16 yes. years, four years, three years. And they're all mounting up. And I'm like, oh my God. So it, it tallied up, if I tell you the truth, to nigh on 300 years. So we're all sitting there and, and I'm looking at this person and, and he's on his own. His wife isn't in court now. She isn't there, is she? Um, and all his so called friends that turned up to give him character witnesses. Not one of them was there. Not one of them. Did he try and speak on his behalf? The last thing he said was, after she had sent, given him all these years, he stood, he stood up abruptly, didn't he? And he said, I'd like, can I say something? And the, and the screw grabbed him and went, no, you can't. And they and take they him down. Him through and the they dragged door. him out. Yeah. And then this person started screaming and shouting. And, and so the judge was left the court and that was the end of it. So yeah. So that was that, was, yeah. But I take no, you know, I said in, in, in my book, I don't take no satisfaction out of, I just feel, you know, I pitied him. I didn't hate him anymore. I wanted to kill him for years and I really did. You know, I could have quite easily, when I was in, in that state, when I went through the early part of the investigation and all these horrors came back, I won't lie to you, I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. I used to have a nightmare and I had this nightmare and it was weird because I'd forgotten about it. When he took me to this to this basement where we cleared the boxes out, there was a mustard yellow door. And I said to the police, he used to take me to an, uh, take me to a house. I can know the road, Park Lane, Wallington. He used to go, it's up on the right hand side or down on the left. I can't remember the name of the number. I said, but if you go through the land registry, and I kept saying to this detective, why 
Why have you not tried to find this address? Park Lane, Wellington. I'm telling you, I know that's where it was. Eventually, she said to me, oh, I've got good news and bad news. I said, well, give me the bad news. And she said, number three, Park, Park Lane, Wellington. He didn't own it. And I said, all oh, right, okay then. So I thought, oh, well, that's out of it. She said his dad did. It was his dad's house. So what would I have remembered all them years of that road? I remembered the road. I knew exactly where it was. So that turned out to be true. That you know, so that proved that I wasn't lying. That his dad owned number three, Park Lane, Wellington. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it had a basement. But in my dream, there was and I forgot all about it, it had a mustard yellow door. And my dream was every time he I think I'm out of just as I'm out of his reach, the door would open and he'd grab me again. So that was my dream for a long time. But truthfully, since I've been, since my life's changed now, I'm, I've never been as happy as I am now. God, fantastic. Ne man. Never. I can honestly say, yeah. hand on heart, I've yeah. got tremendous people around me, beautiful people now. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. I'm very, very lucky. Amy is such a sweetheart, such a lovely person. And, you know, what I say, what have I got to moan about? I've, I've got, like, you know, the other victims, unfortunately, are not having it as easy as me. They're still traumatised by it. And this court case has dragged a lot of their past up. But and he managed to sell his assets, didn't he? And his wife oh, ran away. That's no. You wouldn't believe what they've done. Just after he got found guilty, he managed to yeah. move all of his assets and property into her name. And knowing knowing that we were going to come after him because I, I had a phone call from Survivors UK, didn't I? Yeah. Their lawyer phoned me. And I said, yeah. I said to Amy, you know, because I, I said in court and I didn't do it for money. No. And they phoned me and said, look, we are acting on behalf of you. We, we've looked into Clayton. He is quite wealthy. Um, you're entitled to a lot of money in compensation. And, and I said, I didn't do it for money. And they said, well, if you don't, someone else will. And I said, okay. I said, okay, I'll, I'll go no win, no fee with you. But the money that you get, you give to Survivors UK. I didn't want to, I didn't want, I just, you know, so I said, you give half the money to Survivors UK, which would have been a lot of money. Anyway, they've been looking into him, looking into him, trying to, and then we've just found out, haven't we? Yeah. But yeah, he yeah. had already, um, yeah, moved them into her name. So during, she, that, during that five years, he was structuring it, was he? he as soon as, yeah, soon, oh, you wouldn't believe what he was up to. And they've looked it into was, him. It was as soon as he got found guilty, he still managed to do that after being found guilty. Mm. So between being found guilty and waiting for sentencing, he'd signed, he had everything. signed everything over to her. But is that yeah. legal? No, I, I don't think it is legal. But she's since sold the houses that he'd signed over to her and disappeared. Mm -hmm. So the criminal off the face of the earth. Well, they're trying to find her at the moment. They know that she's still in the area, but they're trying to find her. And she was in the room next door. Criminal compensation have to pay all of us a certain amount of money. I don't know how much it is. I'm not going to sit here and say it's not a lot. You don't get a lot. But legally, the criminal compensation board have to pay all of his victims a certain amount of money. Okay. Why should she be allowed to walk away with his money and your tax, all of our taxes? Pay are paying criminal compensation, yet his assets she's living off of. They shouldn't have allowed him. So, so even though we've had a good result with the sentence, there's still a lot to be done in the legal system for these people. A million percent, yeah, a million percent. I mean, I always was a, I always thought the death penalty was the way forward personally. I, I thought anybody that, that does what he did to me, they shouldn't be allowed to live, you know. What about chemical castration? Yeah, to, yeah, to a certain extent. I mean, I've phoned LBC a few times when I've been in the country mm -hmm. and, and I've talked to, you know, they've been in the programmes. They had a programme on LBC about, they said that paedophiles should be given like life like dolls of children. And how did we feel about that? So I phoned them up and I told them my story. I couldn't go into detail because the trial hadn't happened then. I said, I was just waiting for the trial to start. And I was just like, how can you... Surely, if you're going to give them a doll to have sex with, it's going to encourage them to want more. And some idiot, some psychologist has come up with this idea that if we gave lifelike dolls of children, it would stop their urge to rape other children. Mm. Come on. Let us know in the comments what you think about that, viewers. Would chemical castration, life size, life dolls. Oh it's God, crazy. I can't believe what I'm hearing. It's absolutely crazy. But as I say, you know. <sighs> I just feel for the other victims that are not as strong as me. I can honestly say Amy has, has helped me massively. My, 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 um, 
my counsellors, Survivors UK, you know, Roxana and Guyana, I will name them because they're just amazing human beings. They don't earn a lot of money, you know, and, and Survivors UK, if anybody's watching this, you want to donate or run for charity or do any charity work, they are, they run on a charity. They're a charity organisation. They help men that have been raped and abused. They're a, and without them, truthfully, stand on me, I wouldn't have got through this trial. I was in a bad way for a while and I'm a strong person, but I was not ready for the horrors that were going to come back after having to go through this. And it was horrific. The hardest thing I've ever had to go through. But, you know. And your book's now worldwide on Amazon? You can get it on Amazon. Yeah, Paul Stevens, You Can't Hurt Me. Um, and Beyond the Hurt will be released in the next, uh, hopefully next month. Yeah, it's finished now. And I wrote in lockdown in Australia. I, I started writing it. Um, just to take my mind off things. And, and I wrote it in a year. That took three years. I wrote Beyond the Hurt in a year. And it, it, it's everything that I've discovered since this. So it's a, a very, yeah, I, th I feel, I feel it's, a, it's better than this book personally, but you know, you know, and I'm listening, I'm not an author. People say to me, oh, you've got an author and you I'm not an author. I'm not an author. I just write from my heart. And anybody that reads this that knows me knows that I wrote it because I write as I talk. So if Paul, if people want to like, Follow you on socials or contact you. Is that possible? Are you on socials? Yeah, you can get me on um, uh, Zite Books is, is, is my publisher. Zite Books, Z-I-T-E, Zite Books. Um, I run a blog on that. Um, I'd say I run a blog. I write a blog and I send it to my publisher and he does it because I say I don't do social media. So but I, don't, I don't, I'm not on Facebook. I, I don't do social media. You've got Twitter. Before. Sorry? You've got Twitter. Twitter, have I? Have I got Twitter? Oh, I've got Twitter now. What's your Twitter handle? I haven't got a clue. You can't hurt me. <laughs> you can't hurt me. Okay, so at you can't hurt me is Paul's Twitter On handle. Twitter line, yeah. So, yeah. But I will have to get into this social media thing. I know I do. That's I want to raise money. Honestly, I'm doing this for one reason only. This book has helped convict a monster. And that's what we, we've got that on the cover of the next book, the book that helped convict a monster. And it did. And it was the most horrific thing. To, I'm not going to see here and lie and say it was easy. It was the most horrific, horrible thing. But... Now it's done. I'm I'm making I'm, I'm making money. I want to make money for survivors, and that is the reason I'm doing this now. Mm. We want to raise money for Survivors UK. They're a massive organisation, and and had they not helped me, honestly, I don't know where I'd be now. I don't. I really don't know where I'd be. I was in a real bad way when this came to the fold because I'd locked it away for so many years. Mm. You know, I couldn't even I couldn't even go to work some days. I would just you know, it was yeah. But it's good now. I'm I'm real good. Life's great, you know. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the rest. Go back to Australia, <laughs> and um, you know, and start living. It's going to be good. And people watching this, you know, this was very intense. It was harrowing. Just we salute your bravery and your authenticity, and just telling us everything and um, and all the other victims. I mean, I was just a yeah. small part of this cog. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I will say this: if you've, if everyone's watching this, don't be afraid. If you have been abused, don't let these people get away with it. There are the police now have got special teams and they do believe you. So don't think they don't. Don't sit there and suffer because if you if you do suffer, it will come back in your later years. It did and it nearly destroyed me, truth. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm lucky. Yeah, yeah. But other people are not. But anyway, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank yeah. You so much. Yeah. Well done. Well done. Yeah, thank you. Wow. So Gadfly Press is hugely proud to announce the publication of Killing Escobar and Soldier Stories by Peter McAleese. If you've not seen our podcast we've done with Peter, check it out. And the book is now available worldwide on Amazon in all formats. And Peter was hired out of Scotland, mercenary by the Cali Cartel, to assassinate Pablo Escobar one of the most famous gangsters in the history of the world. The mission is all detailed in the book, as well as Peter's many soldier stories from various countries and continents of the world. So mind-blowing, gripping, as seen on BBC TV. This is the book, the story that Killing Escobar is based on, Peter McAleese's testimony. The link will be in the description box below the video. Available worldwide on Amazon. Cheers.